Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. We are in the middle of a series just getting started, really, the Psalms. We're looking at these inspired scripture songs written over, well, maybe a thousand years altogether that give us counsel about how to live as men and women of God in these last days of Earth's history. So welcome today. Teach us to pray from the Psalms. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to the team. This is going to be a great series, isn't it? I'm excited today because one of our team, Brittany, is going to be leading our study. Always enjoy having our team teachers here. And we've got some remote team members with us, too. Let's see who we have. Nicholas, good to see you again. Glad you're with us today. And Leah, always good to have you on the team. We're glad to have our remote team members to add some greater depth to our discussion. And we're glad that you're here with us because you are part of our global interactive Bible study. We love to hear from you. Write to us at sshope at hopetv.org. Tell us, maybe you're leading an interactive Bible study in your area, in your church, or in a small group. We'd love to hear how God's blessing you through His Word. Well, I'm excited as we're beginning this series on the Psalms that we have a special gift for you, and we have a special guest to tell us about that gift. So I want to invite my wife, Bodil. Sometimes they say, Bodil, can't your wife come and say hello? Mm -hmm. So tell them about the special gift that we have for this series on the Psalms. Right. So the special gift is a collection of six scripture songs from the Psalms. And that includes the theme song, right? Yes. Psalm 105. So, you know, my wife's been composing scripture songs since our boys were little, and those trilogy scripture songs have blessed many lives, and we want you to be blessed as well. And one of them, we're going to sing in just a minute. Thank you, okay. Bodil. So, take advantage of that free gift of six trilogy scripture songs from the Psalms by going to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. Click on the free gift tab and you can get your free collection of songs, including the one that we'll be singing. Well, we could even sing it right now. It's taken from Psalm 105. Let's sing it together. so excited wanting to sing that song, Oh, Give Thanks to the Lord. I forgot to share with you some of our Hope Sabbath School members around the world who've written in. So I'm going to do that, uh, Brittany, before we pray and begin our study. Here is someone, well, he says, good day. So you could guess where he's from. <laughs> from Australia, Samuel writes, he says, good day, Hope Sabbath School. And we good say, good day. Good day. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> I watch your show. Each week, actually, he says, I listen to your show each week while driving to work. I'm truly blessed with a loving wife and three happy and healthy children and a career as a longshoreman that he works in uh, shipping with every Friday sunset to Saturday sunset off site so I can honor the Sabbath each week. Amen. Praise Amen. Amen. 
He said it's been like that for 16 plus years, wow. never had a problem. He thinks he's the only longshoreman in the <laughs> southern hemisphere that gets Sabbath off every week. Well, I'm not sure if that's true, Samuel. It could be true, but praise God that God's honoring him and his commitment to mm -hmm. honor God. Amen? Amen. Amen? So thanks for writing to us. And he said, a loving wife and three beautiful children. Praise God. Here is a note from a viewer in Michigan, a Hope Sabbath School member. Hey, Travis, would you give a wave to Cheryl and her family? Travis, a fellow Michigander. Is that what they call someone mm -hmm. from Michigan? <laughs> we so enjoy watching Hope Sabbath School each week, writes Cheryl. I appreciate the insights class members make. I also think it's great to have remote members. Well, I don't know if we can put uh, one of the remote members up there and have somebody wave. Nicholas, <laughs> could you wave at Sherry and the folks in Michigan? <laughs> We're glad to have remote team members with us. May God continue to bless you. Thanks for writing to us, uh, Cheryl from Michigan. Here's a handwritten note from a couple in Florida, and I want to say thank you to each one of you who sent little handwritten notes they write and say, thank you for sending the message, the wonderful news of God's love to the world mm -hmm. through Hope Sabbath School. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's blessings and a gift of $47. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm sure there's some significance to the four and the seven, but God bless you. Thank you for being part of this ministry. And thanks to each one of you that mm -hmm. chooses to support what God is doing through the ministry of Hope Sabbath School. You can go to our website, by the way, hopetv.org slash hopess, click on the donate button, or find an address and write to us as our donors just did. One last note from Widron in Zambia. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of Hope Sabbath School members in Zambia. And uh, Widron writes, thank you for the good job you are doing teaching us about the Bible. Personally, I've been following this program since its inception here in Zambia. Mm. It has grown my faith in my Christian life. Mm. Amen. Amen. Keep it up. And we are praying for you, Widron from Lusaka. Well, Widron, thanks for writing to us. We're glad you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. I'm excited about today's study, Teach Us to Pray. And our team teacher, Brittany, is going to lead us in prayer as we study. Mm. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to call you our Father and to know you. And we thank you for sending Jesus to die for us and for giving us hope of everlasting life with you. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, Jesus, for the promise of the Holy Spirit that will help us as we study your word today. And we just invite the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and minds as we open up your word, that it would be truly living and active. Amen. And that it would come alive and change not only our lives here in the studio, but those lives of all who will hear in the future around the world. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, have you ever heard a little child learning how to pray? Mm. It's one of the sweetest things to hear. And a lot of times when a child learns to pray, they start out repeating what their parent or <laughs> that's adult true. that's teaching them is telling them to say, right? And it might be something simple like praying for food. And they might say, you know, dear Jesus. And then the little child says, dear Jesus. And then, you know, thank you for the food. Thank you for the food. And, you know, we love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. And then it's so sweet when they get to that stage where they want to pray on their own mm -hmm. and they start, you know, coming up with their own prayers. And many times they're praying about simple little things that we kind of forget to bring to God, right? Um, they might pray about, um, you know, I just stubbed my toe, or they might pray about their stuffed animal that they think is sick or, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. But I love seeing their heart and how they trust God yeah. and how they believe that whatever they tell God, he hears them and he's going to answer. <laughs> and so may we be like little children today as we come to the book of Psalms and as we study and learn how to pray, may we have that mindset mm -hmm. of a little child that God is teaching us how to pray and we're hearing from him, we're repeating after him and then um, he's bringing scripture to our mind as we pray as well. Mm -hmm. So as we start today, we want to look at a scripture about how uh, Jesus' disciples actually came to him and they asked him 
how to pray. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go to the book of Luke in chapter 11 and verse one. And I'm going to ask Stephanie to read that for us as we get started. All right. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Thank you, Stephanie. And what was Jesus' response to this request? Mm. Did he just dismiss it and say, you know, there's a lot of scriptures you can go and look at. Um, <laughs> you, there, you have all the Psalms. Um, what did he say next? He prayed. Jesus. He prayed, right? Yeah. And so let's look at what Jesus prayed in the following verses. I'm going to ask Travis to continue for us in verses two through four. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Travis. Now, when people hear this request of the disciples and then the response of Jesus, some may conclude this is the only way we should pray, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, gave us an example and we should just repeat what he said over and over again. Um, now, are there any scriptures that, that either say, yes, we should do that or no, we should not? Um, and can you share any of those scriptures with us? Mm. Yes, yes oh, Samantha. Ephesians 6, 18 to 19. Would you take us there? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Ephesians 6, verse 18 and 19. And it reads, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Mm. Thank you, Samantha. So here we have Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians, right? And in it, he's saying, pray for me so that I have the Holy Spirit and the power to share the gospel with everyone that I meet, right? So he's saying, make a personal prayer request on my behalf or intercede for me, which wasn't part of the Lord's prayer, <laughs> right? right? right. Um, but that is something very important, an important part of prayer. Harold, you wanted to add to that. Well, even Jesus, if you go to John 17, I mean, it's a long prayer, but Jesus is pouring out his heart to God and praying for his disciples and for the world, mm -hmm. uh, even for the disciples that will be, you know, made even after his time yes. on earth. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so Jesus has more than one prayer, right, in sure. the scriptures. I, yes. I think there's a little reference in Matthew's uh, mm -hmm. account. It says, in this manner. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Jesus is saying, this is kind of a, a model, yeah. a way to pray, begin praising God, making requests, mm -hmm. close by praising God again. Mm -hmm. but, but you make a good point. There are many examples where uh, we're not just praying. Uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Derek. Yeah, and there's a couple other verses I'd like us to look at. Let's go to Philippians chapter one, verses three through four, and I'm gonna ask Nicholas to read that for us. In Philippians one, verses three through four. Yes, Philippians one, three through four, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you, with all joy. Thank you, Nicholas. So here's Paul again, and here he's writing a letter to uh, the Philippians, those in Philippi, right? And he's praising God for these people. So we can thank God for people that have made a difference or that maybe we've seen um, them accept the gospel, and he's just thanking God for that work. Um, Travis, did you want to add to that? Well, I just want to build on what Derek had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier and on this whole concept that we're talking about, and that is, in, in Matthew, that's what Derek was mm -hmm. referring to in Matthew chapter six, um, in verse nine, it says, in this manner, um, pray or with this. And so it's almost like he gives us that model, but then he actually 
Jesus recites the same prayer that we read in Luke. It's the same, it's the Lord's prayer. And something Derek, I learned from Derek a long time ago, Derek, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, I, <laughs> but, but you preach actually the first sermon ever you, pre, you preached, you taught the congregation to pray, and I see, believe we see this here in this motto, um, recognizing God's authority mm-hmm. under uh, and according to His will. And that changed my prayer life because I realized that I first need to recognize who God is. So this, the beginning of the model prayer that I believe God gives is recognize author- His authority and praying according to His will. Thank you for that, Amen. Um, adding that, Travis, that beautiful comment. And I love how um, Jesus says, our Father in heaven, right? So we can approach Him as a child coming to our Father um, as a loving, a loving Father, right? And so it's so beautiful to see. Um, and as if you, we could spend a whole study just breaking down the Lord's <laughs> Prayer, but right. it does give us a real outline because it has praise, it has confession, it has supplication, asking for our needs. It's asking for victory over Satan. It's asking for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's a lot of elements that we focus on in prayer that are outlined there. Um, and so it's a beautiful example for us. Thank you, each one. And there is one more verse I'd like us to look at in Matthew. And Jesus actually gives instructions saying how um, when we pray that we should avoid certain things. And so we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse verses 7 and 8, and I'm going to ask Leah to read that for us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And it reads, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. Mm. So what can we learn from that verse? What important um, teaching is Jesus mm. giving to his disciples and to us today? I see mm. Puya, you smiling when you when we finished reading that verse. Right, it's so practical because I think it's uh, yes. it may be misleading for some people thinking that there is a secret way of chanting words, mm. repeating. Ah words to have access to God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think Jesus is teaching us that just talk to God mm-hmm. as your father. Yes. It's right. like how you would talk to, you know, uh, earthly father. Mm-hmm. Just talk to him, approach him. You don't have to repeat some, mm-hmm. some coded, you know, chanting words in order to have a special reach to God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Puya. Yes, Stephanie. It makes me think that God is saying, be real with me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to have vain repetition. Mm-hmm. And it's even in verse 8 that the Father knows the things that you need. So He's asking mm-hmm. us, come and ask for what is impacting you today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Stephanie. And I saw Leah, you had a comment as well? Just building off of what Stephanie was saying, um, he already knows what we need, but he wants to hear from us anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's just further proof that God desires to have relationship with us, Mm -hmm. that we need him and he knows that we need him, but he already knows what we need. He just wants the communication and the relationship. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Leah. And it just reminds me of that parent-child relationship mm-hmm. again, right? Um, many times when a child is crying, uh, the parent knows exactly what they need. Oh, they're hungry again. Oh, they're sleepy. They haven't had their nap. Oh, you know, they are in a mood because they didn't sleep well last night. But many times once the child can speak, the parent asks them, what is it that you need? And then the child will, you know, respond and, and it builds that relationship. So thank you, Leah. Samantha, you and would like to And also, God, he's trying to tell us that you don't have to try to impress me. Mm-hmm. I know you, I form you. Mm-hmm. You understand? We don't, we don't have to worry about spell checks and grammatical errors mm-hmm. with God. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. go to Him. Mm-hmm. That's so true. Thank you, Samantha. You know, Brittany, th- th- we, we take for granted this thing about don't pray with vain repetitions, mm-hmm. but it's really so important. Mm-hmm. I remember as a teenager visiting a, a major religious site, mm-hmm. and people mm-hmm. were just repeating the prayers over and over again, and I could have been uh, in Europe, or I could have been in uh, in Asia, but where people are just, mm-hmm. and and God's saying that that's not a relationship conversation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I know we're going to go to the Psalms and learn some things about prayer there, but 
uh, really reinforce that it is the opening of the heart to God yeah. mm -hmm. as to a friend That's right. or to a loving parent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you all for your comments. Well, now we are going to turn to the Psalms and we're going to see how um, we can learn how to pray from the Psalms. And so we're going to go to Psalm 23. And I want to make this practical because there may be viewers around the world that are asking, how can I pray? I don't know how to pray. Um, you know, I've only been taught the Lord's Prayer or I've only been taught, you know, a specific scripture and I don't know how to communicate with God. And so I would like our team to kind of demonstrate not necessarily a prayer, but just how would you pray in response to these scriptures that we're going to look at together today? And so let's go to Psalm 23 to start that most famous Psalm, I believe. And we talked a little bit about it in our last lesson, but we're going to go to Psalm 23 and I'm going to ask um, Harold, uh, rather than reading the whole Psalm, just how would you uh, pray in response to that psalm? Since that's a very well-known psalm, um, and if you haven't read it before, I encourage you to open the shepherd, Bible. Right? Yep, the Lord is my shepherd. Go and open Psalm 23 and read it. And um, Harold, give us an example. What would you say in response after reading that psalm to God? Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I can take like the beginning verse, like the Lord is my shepherd, like like, Lord, I know that I can trust you because you're going to lead me. I don't know where I need to be, where I need to go, but just following you, I, I, I should be at peace because eventually it says he leads me, he, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie beside still water. So it's like, I'm taken care of. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. help me, Lord, help me just uh, follow you as my shepherd. That's right. Mm. Yeah. Puya, you would like to add to that? Yes, I would say pray through the psalm. Mm -hmm. You know, put yourself in the shoe of the one who wrote it. For example, in this place, David. David was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. I may not uh, have never have the experience of being a shepherd, but I could imagine, you know, what David must have went through as he wrote the psalm, thinking, okay, God, you're like a shepherd. You know, I, I am like a sheep that needs uh, somebody to look after me. Mm -hmm. So putting myself in the story, asking the question, who is God in this psalm? Who am I in this psalm? And so the picture becomes very clear. God is presented as a shepherd, and I am presented as a, a little sheep <laughs> needing somebody to protect me. And so as you read through the psalm and pray through the psalm, as you put yourself in the shoe of the writer, I, pick, I, I believe the prayer would be very experiential. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. What a great example for us to um, imagine ourselves in the experience of the person writing the psalm and, and realizing I am like a helpless sheep. Mm. Yeah. I can't save myself. Right. I don't know where I'm going today. I can't provide for myself, mm -hmm. but God can mm -hmm. and, and letting him uh, encourage you through that prayer. Travis, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, I was just agreeing uh, with, I, I was actually appreciating mm -hmm. his description of God at the, being the shepherd mm -hmm. and him being the little sheep. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that was a great, you know, great way to put yourself in the psalm as the writer, uh, because I think, um, I think that's a real practical way of, of learning from the, of the Bible writers. That's right. Thank you all. Tendi, you wanted to add to that as well. Yes. Um, I wanted to say that you should claim the promises that are mm -hmm. in the psalm. Mm -hmm. um, it says in verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Mm -hmm. um, when you pray and you talk to God as a friend, mm -hmm. claim that promise and tell him that you believe in it mm -hmm. and therefore it will happen in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. These promises are not empty words, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, God made the promise and he wants to renew the promise in our heart and our life today. Mm -hmm. So thank you for reminding us of that, Tendi. Let's look at another example. Let's go to Psalm 27, and we're going to read this one together. In Psalm chapter 27, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, and I'm going to ask Kylinda to read that for us. I will be reading Psalm 27, verses 1 through 5, and this is from the New King James Version. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid mm. when the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh? My mm. enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Mm. Though war may rise against me, 
In this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Amen. That's beautiful. And we are going to read two more verses in this psalm as well. And so, Kylan, if you would drop to verses 13 and 14, and then we're going to discuss how um, we can make this psalm practical in prayer as well. Of course, starting in verse 13, again with the New King James Version. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Mm, thank you, Kylinda. Mm, amen. Now, anyone from the team, would you like to share um, an example of how you would pray in response to that psalm? Or maybe you have felt like the psalmist um, at a point in your life, and this psalm really speaks to you, and, and it did encourage you. Um, anyone would like to share? Yes, Stephanie? It, yes, it does actually for me. And my response is, Lord, help me to keep my eyes fixed on you mm. and not the things that are happening around me. Mm. Help me not to be discouraged by that, but keep my eyes focused on you. Mm -hmm. mm. Beautiful. Jeffrey? Yes, it reminds me of, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Mm. Yeah. yeah. This is the situation where we don't need to like you said, we don't need to look around, we need to look up. Mm. So, Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Kylinda. I like to sometimes write the words of the psalm out, mm. and then I'll write the verse, but this time maybe applying it to my own particular want or mm. slightly altering the words. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking about verse two, like when the wicked come against me to mm. eat up my flesh, I could say, well, when test anxiety is coming yes. due to this yes. class, mm -hmm. then this is my response. And mm -hmm. so I can um, personalize it to mm -hmm. my situation. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Thank you, mm -hmm. Kylinda, for sharing that example. Samantha. For me, and I would pray, you know, Lord, give me the faith to believe in the power that you have to protect me mm -hmm. and also help me to wait upon you because sometimes we don't get the answer we want, but help us that we will be able to trust in your power to come through for us. Beautiful. Harold, you would also like to add to that? Yeah. In relation to verse 13 and 14, I can see like a prayer formulating in regards to being patient and waiting on the Lord, because at times we might have to endure some pain and suffering, but at the same time we can say, wait on the Lord, like, Lord, help me wait on you, because I don't know what transform transforming work you're doing on the other person who is mm -hmm. committing the harm. And I've heard so many testimonies of people where their persecutors, you know, did many things, mm -hmm. but then they follow the Lord mm -hmm. because God made it open a door. And they're like, you know, I'm a believer thanks to you, even though I, you know, did these things, forgive me. So it's like, mm -hmm. wow. So mm -hmm. it's, we do need that extra strength. And I think we can claim that promise from these verses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not just vain words. God is actually encouraging our heart, right? Strengthening our heart um, and giving us courage to keep moving forward despite the circumstances that we're going through. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Let's read another Psalm and let's see how we could pray in response to that. Let's go to Psalm chapter 34, verses one through three. And I would like Nicholas to read that for us. Psalm 34, one through three. And um, keep your Bible open, Nicholas, because we're gonna also read some other verses after that in the same chapter. Yes, I will be reading from the New King James Version, Psalm 34, one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Thank you, Nicholas. <laughs> so before we keep reading the other verses, how would you pray in response to that Psalm? 
-hmm. that portion of the psalm. Yes, Travis. Well, I was um, impressed by these first couple of verses because here he's inviting people to pray and praise God with him. Mm. So I, mm. here we see um, him introducing corporate prayer, corporate mm -hmm. praise, mm -hmm. uh, corporate prayers of praise, I guess, um, mm -hmm. to the God Almighty. And, mm -hmm. and so that's what, um, that's something I learned from that prayer. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Samantha. And it's kind of like sometimes um, we, we start to pray and we just started to ask God for all kinds of things before we first acknowledge mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. for who he is. Mm -hmm. So it's first giving him that praise and adoration, mm -hmm. just saying thanks to him for all that he has done before we go with our laundry list of things that we want him to grant mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, what I see here. You know? That's so important. Yes, Derek. I had to smile while Nicholas, uh, maybe he'll share a little testimony, but <laughs> I had to smile while he was reading that because his mother sang that scripture song to him <laughs> as a little boy. Mm -hmm. And I saw him reading it with real enthusiasm mm -hmm. because that word is actually in his heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think what we, we'll see where we actually begin to use words inspired songs as part of our prayer mm -hmm. because it reflects um, our, our own thoughts and feelings. But mm -hmm. it's just a great illustration again, uh, as some, some may know, uh, uh, Nicholas's mother, Ashley, was the lead vocalist on our, our theme song for this mm -hmm. series. And it just illustrates when the word is in you how powerful it can be, the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit can use it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Derek. I did see your hand raised, Nicholas. Did you want to add to that? And then I'll have you continue reading after that. Uh, yes, absolutely. One other thing I was going to mention in relation to praying with the Psalms is we're often given cues about the spirit our heart should be in mm -hmm. as we're praying these. Right. I noticed in verse 2, uh, David writes, the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Mm. So as we're praying through this, we can also say, Lord, give me that humility mm. and make my boast only in you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Amen. Nicholas. Would you keep reading for us in verses four through seven of the same chapter, please? Yes, absolutely. Starting in verse four, again, from the New King James Version, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around oh. those who fear him and delivers them. Mm, Amen. Beautiful. There's so many instances <laughs> in our lives mm. where we don't always realize God is there delivering us, but there are some times where we get a glimpse into that, right? Um, where we see, you know, we're in traffic and this car cuts us off or mm -hmm. we see, you know, different things and it could have been an accident or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I am hiking and I slip and I could have fallen off the cliff, right? There's all of these times in our life and sometimes we get to see a glimpse of God was there, mm -hmm. but there's many times in our life we don't see mm -hmm. that he was there protecting us, right? And one day in heaven, we'll find out all of those times that our guardian angel was protecting us. But I can think of many ways to pray in response to that prayer, um, just those verses rather. For the sake of time, um, Nicholas, would you continue reading? And we're going to read 8 through 10 and then 11 through 22. Yes. Starting in verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Amen. Mm, beautiful. And then would you read 11 through 22? Yes, absolutely. Come, you little children, listen to me. I will teach the fear of the Lord to you. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. And the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them shall be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked 
and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Amen. Amen. Wow. wow, thank you, That's Nicholas. Hot. There's so many nuggets of promise wow. packed in that Psalm, aren't there? Mm -hmm. um, would someone like to give an example of just maybe one phrase that stood out to you or has spoken to you in the past of how you would pray in response to that section that we just read of that Psalm? Mm -hmm. Yes, Nicholas. Yes, one thing that stood out to me again is verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Mm. You know, we are not promised a life free from trials on this earth, but we have that promise that God delivers us Hallelujah. through those Amen. troubling times. Amen. Amen. Thank yes. you, Nicholas. Tendi, I saw you had your hand raised as, as yes. well. Yes, this is actually one of my favorite songs, <laughs> and I love its personality. It's so uh, vibrant, and my favorite verse is um, 8 to 10. Oh, taste and see that mm. the Lord is good. <laughs> Bless is the man who trusts in Him. Mm -hmm. It's a psalm I used uh, quite recently to encourage my cousin who's going through a hard time, mm -hmm. and I just felt like recording a voice note and reading it, mm -hmm. you know, vibrantly mm -hmm. to, to encourage him to trust in the Lord Amen. and taste and see his goodness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Thank you Amen. for that testimony, Tendi. Jeff, I saw you had your hand. Yes, I would like to go to verse 18, mm -hmm. and this is the English Standard Version. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. I have seen in my personal life a lot of friends, a lot of family members mm -hmm. that had this brokenhearted, mm -hmm. crushed spirit. And mm -hmm. it's comforting that even Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. he's with them. Yeah, mm -hmm. what a great promise. And to you who are listening, maybe you've been through something that's difficult, that your heart feels broken, uh, but this promise from the Lord, this song, mm -hmm. can encourage your heart today. Amen. Mm -hmm. So please read that over, meditate on the words, and let God revive your heart today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Samantha. Um, I look at verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And I remember growing up, in the church with older folks and when they pray there one line I remember distinctly is to fly the trap of the enemies and you know I believe you know God he, he has that power he says to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth that's the, the those who do evil so we mm. see so much wrongs today mm. and we think it's gonna last forever but no God he is doing something about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful mm -hmm. I wish we had time to, to dissect the whole psalm because there's so much packed into it but take time um, journal like Kalinda said write down the psalm and verse by verse go through it and let God speak to you mm. and then respond to him as you hear him speaking to your heart well, let's continue, and I uh, wanted to look at some examples where Jesus actually quoted the Psalms. And so we're going to look at um, a couple of scriptures that show us this, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46 for our first example, Matthew 27, 46, and I'm going to ask Leah to read that for us, please. Matthew 27, verses 46, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, leme sabachthani, that I, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. Thank you, Leah. Wow. Now, does anyone know where Jesus was quoting from? Since we're focusing on the Psalms. Psalms. Yeah. Yes, Tendi. Psalm 22, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And yes. let's just look at that, because we want to see how Jesus was actually uh, remembering a scripture song, right? Mm -hmm. And this was a prophecy about himself. And he is bringing it to mind. He's saying it out loud that the people around who knew the scriptures would remember, wow, this was prophesied and now he's saying it. He must be the Messiah. And so let's uh, read that. Tendi, would you read that for us? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. Why are you so far mm -hmm. away from helping me and from the words of my groanings? Mm. Mm. Thank you, Tendi. Mm. Wow, and we can just see how we can bring our feelings, our emotions, our struggles. Uh, it almost sounds like he feels um, all alone, like 
God has betrayed him, even though we know that later on he says, I commit my spirit into your hands, right? But there's times where we feel like that. And the son of God, the God of the universe also felt like that when he took on our humanity. So mm-hmm. he relates and understands when we feel like that as well. And, and, and we don't have time to, to look at the whole Psalm, but that Psalm is all about Messiah. Mm-hmm. I mean, not one of his bones will be broken. They'll cast lots. I mean, it's like that thousand year old scripture song at the time of Jesus, already a thousand years old is the story of his life, Mm -hmm. especially during those final days. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit brought that scripture song back to his remembrance, Mm -hmm. and he's using the words of the psalmist as a prayer Mm -hmm. to his Father. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding us of that, Derek. Now let's read Luke chapter 23 for another example from Jesus himself, Luke 23, 46. And I'm going to ask Puya if he would be willing to read Luke chapter 23, and verse 46 for us. Sure, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Mm -hmm. Having said this, he breathed his last. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Puya. Does anyone know where Jesus was quoting from in that last words that he spoke before he died? Yes, Travis, I saw you shaking your head. From Psalm 31, 5. Psalm 31.5, and um, you can look that up at home for the sake of time. We're going to continue on in our our study, Um, but he's quoting those exact words, uh, right? He's remembering that scripture song, and he's uh, committing himself to God. He's trusting that even though I didn't feel you here, uh, this sacrifice is going to be enough, right? Amen. I fulfilled your will, and now I'm committing myself to you. Um, And what a great reminder for us at any stage of our life, but especially near the end of our lives, that, you know, my life is in your hands, God, Mm -hmm. and I don't have to fear death, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What a wonderful reminder. Now, we're going to look at how uh, we mentioned in our first study that there is a psalm for every season of life, right? And I want us to share um, how when we read the psalm, if there was a time in your life where that psalm or that sentiment from the psalm um, was meaningful to you and God spoke to you through it or reminded you um, of his presence through it. And so we're going to look at a couple examples. We're going to look at um, one about praise and we're going to look at Psalm 9. Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to ask Kailinda to read that for us. Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I will be reading from the New King James Version. This is a prayer and thanksgiving for the Lord's righteous judgments to the chief musician, to the tune of Death of the Son, a Psalm of David, starting in verse 1. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Mm, beautiful mm-hmm. psalm. And I, we have a scripture song that Bodil has written on and that as in well. The collection in the for collection for this uh, series on the Psalms. Wonderful. If people go to the website. Yeah. Yes, so you can have that as your own to listen to and memorize um, God's word. But anyone have a story from your own life uh, when you were praising God and you were saying similar words to the psalmist here because of something that he did. He answered a prayer or he gave you a promise when you needed it. Um, Anyone have a testimony to share? Stephanie's smiling. I saw you smiling, Stephanie. (laughs) All the floor, but yes, I had been praying very um, sincerely for God's leading in whether or not I should go back to school. Mm. And miracle after miracle (laughs) took place, and I went back to school, and um, I just praise God for how he not only got me there, Mm -hmm. but supplied for all my needs during that time. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for that testimony. So maybe you're praying about a future step and, and God is going to lead you like he did for Stephanie. So thank mm-hmm. you, Stephanie. And, and actually she did what it says, I will tell. Mm-hmm. I will praise you. I will tell. So here in Hope Sabbath right. School, she's just giving that testimony of praise to God. That's right. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that um, after I had that experience, I told the Lord, I said, I will tell whoever you want me to tell. Mm -hmm. And I met uh, Derek and Bodil at prayer meeting in Forest Lake Church. And that Sabbath, he had asked me to give my testimony. So Mm. I said, of course, I can't say no. And then she became a a team member and team teacher Mm -hmm. on Hope's Sabbath School. So that's that's really living 
the message of mm -hmm. the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing that beautiful testimony. <laughs> now let's look at another psalm that focuses on confession and repentance. And we're gonna go to Psalm 51, a pretty famous psalm of David. And uh, the context of this is after he committed adultery mm -hmm. with Bathsheba and then he murdered her husband Terrible. in order to cover up this sin. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until Nathan the prophet came and confronted him that he came to this point of repentance. But I'm going to ask Travis to read that for us in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4, please. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Mm. For I have acknowledged my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Mm. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, mm. that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Mm. Mm -hmm. And would you also keep reading in verses 10 through 12 as well, Travis? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Mm, beautiful. Amen. Has anyone um, had an experience where God confronted them, the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, and you realized you needed to repent? Um, and this, this promise from God, or this Psalm of David, um, actually was some of your words back to God. I saw, Jeffrey, that you had your hand raised. Yes, uh, this is not an experience, but this always, I just immediately jumped to Isaiah uh, chapter 1, verses mm -hmm. 18. So this is the English Standard Version. Okay, give us a minute to get there. Oh, yes. Isaiah chapter oh, yes. 1 and verse 18. Yes. And which version are you reading from? Uh, the English Standard Version. All right, go ahead and read it for us, please. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Mm. Praise God. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the scriptures are connected, right? Yes. Um, mm. And one scripture can remind us of another one. Yes. And we know that uh, David was given forgiveness yes. from God, right? He restored him. Um, he cleaned his heart and he became a man after God's own heart, mm -hmm. even after that experience, right? And he truly repented. Mm -hmm. He didn't just say those words, but mm -hmm. we saw a change, yes. right? Repentance, you're going one way and you turn back towards God, right? And mm -hmm. we see that with David, he turned completely mm -hmm. back to God with his whole heart. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful testimony. Yes. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, I saw Samantha, I saw a lot of hands with this verse, but mm -hmm. Samantha, yeah. would you like to share with yes. us? Um, I've always loved this Psalm um, 51 because you know it shows that no matter how low you think you have gone in sin, once you go to God with a contrite heart like David did, he acknowledged his sins. Right. Mm -hmm. And he also acknowledged God's power to forgive him. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really love it, that there is hope for all of us, no matter how far gone we think we are. Amen. That's right. Thank Praise you, God. Samantha. And yes. Harold, did you have a personal story you wanted to share or just? Well, just in summary, because I have shared like my reckless life before here, mm -hmm. but I mean, I have prayed pretty much similar mm -hmm. words like uh, David did. And I do believe that God does forgive me because mm -hmm. I do have peace afterward. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord, that you, 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 know, you don't mm -hmm. cast me to the side. Thank you that you accept me as you also even accepted David. Mm -hmm. I just pray that, yes, give me a contrite heart. I mean, give me a, a clean heart mm -hmm. and I don't want to do this again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just praise God that he does give me comfort and peace after mm -hmm. that confession Beautiful. happens. Mm -hmm. You yes, know, as uh, that text was being read, just Simon Peter flashed into my mm -hmm. mind having blasphemed and said he didn't even mm. know Jesus. Wow. I can imagine him going to the garden and saying, have mercy on me, O God, right. according to your loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Create in me a clean heart. And, and having the courage to believe mm -hmm. that God is abundant in mercy to all mm -hmm. who call upon him mm -hmm. and becoming a leader of, yes. of God's church. Yeah. Um, but, but this is where I really want to encourage all of us yes. to hide those words in our mm -hmm. heart yeah because that's a prayer that we may need to pray yeah. mm -hmm. and we don't have to stumble with the Holy Spirit will help us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 26, 
the Spirit will help us mm -hmm. to pray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that reminder. We're going to continue on and look at a few more promises and how um, maybe this promise has been special to you specifically at a moment in your life. So we're going to look at how um, there's a promise in Psalm chapter 61 verses 1 through 6 that talks about how God can give us strength when we need it, which I think happens to many of us uh, on a daily basis. But let's read Psalm 61, 1 through 6. And I'm going to ask Leah to read that for us. Psalm 61, verses 1 through 6. This is the English Standard Version. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, mm. for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. Amen. Thank you, Leah. Anyone have a, a short story of how this uh, sentiment from this psalm touched your heart um, when you were in a moment of need? Leah, please share with us. I have used this as a prayer oftentimes when I felt overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the imagery that it portrays. Um, lead me to the rock that is higher and uh, higher than I. I think of you know something larger than myself and very strong. Um, a strong tower against the enemy. God is our fortress that um, we are safe within. Um, I like I like to go camping, so the idea of dwelling in God's tent is very peaceful for me. Um, and then obviously taking refuge under the shelter of his wings, like we had spoken about earlier, kind of like a mother hen gathers her chicks. It's just very comforting to me and provides a lot of peace. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you, Leah, for sharing. We're going to look at one more psalm um, for another season of life and how this may have spoken to you or maybe in the future God will bring this psalm to you when you need it. So we're going to look at Psalm 13, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to ask Puya to read that for us, Psalm 13, 1 through 4. Sure, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him. Let those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. Mm. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I love how David often does that, or the Psalms often do that, that he's focused on his situation, he's discouraged, he's ready to give up, and then he remembers. <laughs> I have a God that's bigger than this situation and he can take Praise care God. of it, right? right? And it's a great reminder for us. Does anyone mm -hmm. have a short testimony, Puya, um, about this promise? It's, it's interesting that you asked me to read this specific, <laughs> this specific psalm because the first uh, verse where it talks, David asked the question, how long will you hide your face from me? Uh, it's a very practical prayer for me because throughout my teenage years, I struggle a lot with doubt. Mm -hmm. Even though I grew up in the church, oftentimes I, I went through moments of doubts whether God even hears my prayer or whether He even exists. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of young people are struggling with doubts mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And this question of, God, how long are you going to hide your face? I need to see you more. Mm -hmm. I need to experience you more. And I really love how David ends uh, the, the, his prayer here mm -hmm. by recounting how God has mm -hmm. dealt with him in the past mm -hmm. yeah. bountifully. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that speaks powerfully because mm -hmm. when you are questioning whether God is listening to your prayers, mm -hmm. think back on how He has dealt with you before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. If yeah. He always has a good record of, a good track record of keeping His promises, mm -hmm. He will keep His promise in the future too. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you for that Amen. powerful Amen. testimony, Beautiful. Puya. As we close our lesson together, there's so many more promises. I encourage you to spend a lot of time in the Psalms mm. and make them your own. Um, you know, respond to God in prayer through them. But I want to share one quote that's from a book called Steps to Christ. And it's a, a beautiful book about how to have a closer walk with Jesus, how to come to Him, how to know Him. And from page 93, there's this promise um, that 
that says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend, mm -hmm. not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. Amen. And may we remember that um, promise that every scripture of God is a promise that God is, it, he wants to have that relationship and that when we pray, it's not like, oh, dear God, please come down into my situation. It's actually God already knows my situation and Lord, lift me up Amen. to see your perspective because his perspective on our situation he sees eternally, right? The end result. We only see this very tiny moment of our lives and it seems overwhelming, but God sees the future and he sees how he's going to work something good out of this difficult situation. And so may we always come to God recognizing he wants to lift us up to him, Amen. that when we're talking to him, that we would leave that prayer session feeling encouraged and lifted Amen. up. And one uh, great way to always feel that way at the end of prayer is to praise him, right? Mm. Praise him for who he is. A lot of times we spend a lot of our prayer just asking God, you know what I'm going through? This is very difficult. And we focus <laughs> on the, the discouraging thing um, instead of focusing on who God is and what he's already done in our lives, like Puya said. Mm. And when we do that, I know when I've been in corporate prayer that we just focus on praising God or thanking him for what he's done. I always leave those sessions feeling so encouraged, like my God can do anything. Amen. Why Amen. am I afraid or why am I feeling discouraged in this moment. And so I encourage you today, um, wherever you're at in your life, whatever season you're going through, um, praise God for who he is. Go to the Psalms and let him encourage your heart through them. Amen. Derek, would you please pray for us? Thank you so much, Brittany. What a powerful study. And thank you for being with us today on Hope Sabbath School. As we we're really repeating the request of the disciples, teach us to pray. And the Spirit of God can help us through the Psalms. Someone here needs to pray, create in me a clean heart, O God. Someone here needs to pray, wait on the Lord and put your name there. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Let's let the Word of God be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this practical study, uh, how from the Psalms we can we can learn more about prayer as we see the psalmists praying to you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit who guided the writing of these inspired songs would guide us as it was promised in Romans 8, 26, that the Spirit would help us when we pray, that we would pray in harmony with your will and that miracles would happen because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. We're just starting our series on the Psalms. Don't forget to get that free collection of Trilogy Scripture songs. Go to our website, hide the Word of God in your heart so that you can be blessed, and then go out, be a blessing to those around you. The American Heart Association recommends 40 minutes of aerobic exercise of moderate to vigorous intensity three to four times a week to lower the risk for heart attack and stroke. However, more than 80% of adults don't meet these guidelines. That's a fact, but there's hope. Don't have 30 minutes? Take three. In a recent Japanese study, moderate intensity physical activity between 32 seconds and 3 minutes was associated with improvements in components of metabolic syndrome, waist circumference, 
blood pressure, blood sugar, and blood fat levels. Integrating short bouts of activity throughout the day can be a healthy first step toward adopting a more active and happy lifestyle. Behind me is the Gateway of India, erected to commemorate the landing of King George and Queen Mary many years ago. This structure was the building that greeted people who arrived by boat, the first thing that they saw of the city of Bombay, today known as Mumbai. It's also the first place on our visit on today's program to this huge, wonderful city. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Krauss. Today's program is coming to you from the city of Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay. And it's Republic Day here and hundreds of people are out in this park enjoying the day, playing India's most popular sport, cricket. In fact, I'm taking my life in my hands here as cricket balls come through from all angles. This is India's most populous city, some 21 million people. In fact, it's one of the world's largest cities and every day thousands of families move into this city because they have hopes of more opportunities in the city. When you look at the, the crowds, when you look at the people, you ask the question, how can the Seventh-day Adventist Church even begin to have an impact in a place like this? We'll be, we'll be looking at that question and, and others on today's program. And first up, let's travel to Mongolia. If you journey through Northern Asia, you're likely to experience great diversity. From small mountain villages to some of the largest cities in the world, the Northern Asia Pacific region has it all. In terms of population, this region is the largest in the world. And we have about 1.6 billion people living in our territories. So when you hear about China and Mongolia, North Korea, and also Japan, you see, and then you can imagine that uh, we have a huge uh, mission challenges in everywhere in our division territories. With such diversity and size, the challenges are clearly visible and can sometimes seem overwhelming. Despite the difficulty, God has willing servants throughout the territory. Many people in our division territories, they have a passion for mission. When we encourage them, when we work together with them with uh, much prayer, I'm sure that the Lord will continue to bless our missionary activities in our division territories. God has opened impossible doors in the past. Not long ago, the country of Mongolia seemed as though the gospel could never cross into its borders. Mongolia is a country where about half of its population lives in the capital city of Ulan Bator. The challenge of spreading the gospel here is evident. Ekbayar was one of the first Mongolians to be baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church back in the 1990s. This is a country as considered as a closed country because we were former, one of the former communist countries. So we all grew up no religion at all. And after 90, 1990s, when communism collapsed, things got changed. Suddenly people found some kind of empty space in their hearts. When Ekbayar was a student, she met a foreign woman at a school and became friends with her. 
her new friend and her husband were sent by Adventist Frontier Missions to Mongolia. One Saturday, Ekbayar went over to her new friend's house and noticed they had just finished studying from a book she didn't recognize. She was curious, so she started asking questions. I want to learn that. And that just sparked a little flame inside that, what is that I want to learn? She was encouraged to join them the next week, and she became eager to learn about the Bible. She went back the next week, and after a while, they became close friends as they studied the Bible together. Every Sabbath, I think since then I never miss a Sabbath meeting. Because of friendship, I get close to God. And I always say, I didn't find God because I was blind and never interested. Only God found me and He made a way to find me. When Jesus was on this earth, He cared for people. He was their friend and He helped them with their problems. As we continue to represent God, shouldn't we follow Christ's example? Ekbayar's heart was touched because those missionaries first shared Christ's love. There are so many things attracted to me because of their kindness and sincerity to Mongolian people. Even they serve to poorest people that we never think of to helping them. But they're so kind and nice people. And finally I found it's because of God in their heart. They, became, they are so kind and they became very close to my heart. And through their friendship, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And because of their kindness, I learned how to be kind to others. Because of their true friendship, I became close to Jesus as my friend. Since then, other Mongolians have come to know the love of Jesus. Thanks to Adventist churches and schools, people in Mongolia can learn about Jesus. Despite the challenges in countries like Mongolia, God is now using faithful servants like Ekbayar to spread his message. Please continue to pray for territories like those in the Northern Asia Pacific region. Pray that the work can move quickly through these difficult areas. But these countries are beautiful too. You know? and God has blessed these countries in many ways. And we hope that uh, we can spread the gospel message to the people in our territories so many people can be saved into the kingdom of God. My guest is Dr. Solomon, who is a behavioral science researcher and teacher here in the city of Mumbai. Dr. Solomon, thanks for joining us. Now, you are a Seventh-day Adventist Church member who's been living here for how long? Yeah, about 28 years. 28 years. So you know this city well, and, and you are one among 21 million people, and I think I've seen almost all of them today because it's such a busy place. What, tell us about this city. What, what, what's, what's distinctive about it? What makes it a, a, a tick? Yes. Uh, in India, Mumbai is considered to be the city that is a magnet for m migrants. Uh, this is so because this is a place which is considered to be a dream city for the people of India because people believe that they can come over to India and they can get jobs and make life. Uh, there have been lots of stories of people who came with almost nothing and they became millionaires. So people around India, they think that Mumbai is a wonderful city that they also can come about and become big persons. Okay? And I think that's what attracts people. And one more real truth is that nobody who comes to Mumbai goes empty-handed. They all get jobs and they get settled down over here and they may find difficulty in finding I mean, accommodation and other things, but jobs they will always get and that's why people come over here. Right. So obviously in this city there's some fabulous wealth, but I've also seen people who are struggling to survive, but it all comes together in a mass of people who, and you look at, you look at this and you say, okay, well we're an Adventist church here of maybe 10,000 members. What sort of impact can we make on the city? What, what do we have to offer? Well, I believe that Adventist church is a very unique church, having a very unique message than most other people. And if only we can make use of that unique message, whether it is a health message or message for the youth, 
uh, these messages can have a strong impact on people. And I, I feel that in a city like this, there are lots of people who are experiencing loneliness. You know, as I said, lots of people are coming over to the city and they come and try to make a life. But when they come to the city, they find very lonely and they also find that the life is quite tough and they are looking for some sense and meaning in their life and they want to really see to that that uh, their life is you know pleasant and uh, and that they are able to adjust very well and they are the people i suppose that we can reach them and present them about uh, the message of love and peace that jesus offers to us yeah now dr solomon you've been involved for some time in a in-depth longitudinal study of young people working with researchers in America, Australia, and here. What are you finding out about the youth here in India? Uh, well, I have begun this study way back in 2010. The study name is called as uh, International Youth Development Study. This study has been conducted in three nations, three continents, and in three cities. Um, Melbourne City in Australia, and Seattle City in USA, and Mumbai City in, uh, in India. In these three cities, what we are doing is that we have been after the young people, especially from the schools, and we reach them and we, we administer a psychological test, a survey questionnaire that we administer, and we have been following this youth for year after year, as it is a longitudinal study. The purpose of this study is to find out how young people's lives are being influenced because of the globalized, globalization factors. You know, the life has been moving very fast these days and information technology has impacting them. And it's not only impacting the young people, but also impacting what young people are connected with. That is their families and their schools, their peers, uh, even their church also, I mean, as a religious organization that they are connected. So we are trying to find out how these connections are influencing the young people and how these connections are uh, uh, making the young people to adapt themselves effectively and thus determining their behavior, whether their behavior is going to be a risk behavior or problem behavior or a behavior which is uh, uh, supported with lots of protective factors. So, uh, so the areas that you're talking about, surely we as Seventh-day Adventists would have something to, to say, to contribute, to help in the uh, yes, I do agree with you and I believe strongly that this research helps us to understand at least uh, what are the needs that young people are facing in, this, uh, in, in these large cities in general. And it also helps us to understand that uh, um, which contexts are uh, very strongly influencing people like for example whether it is the context of peer groups or it's the context of families. So when we know that, uh, for example, if we come to know that families are weak uh, families have got risk factors such as you know in, in some families there is a problem of addiction and things like that when we come to know that I mean as a church I suppose we can also work with the families and help them to turn out turn these families as a as a source of strong protective factors you know we can help families to be I mean, built up help the people to get get themselves out of these uh, risk behaviors where through which they are setting a wrong examples or wrong models to these um, young people. So in that way, I think that this research can help the church to know about what are the needs and what are the problems that we see in the society. Dr. Solomon, you've been involved in health ministry here in Mumbai. Briefly tell me what, what, that's, what that's been in, in, incorporating. Well, we do need, we do notice that in the city like this, as large number of people come, they have problems of accommodation and they, ha they do face several different, different problems. And uh, uh, being a crowded city, there are limits for effective sanitary um, systems and all that. For all these reasons, we do have a problem, health, serious health problems. You know, people often fall sick to, um, say suppose uh, malaria and dengue and during the monsoon period that uh, yeah, people also fall sick to gastroenteritis and uh, people fall sick to these illnesses partially because they are unaware about how to take care of their health. Now Seventh-day Adventist Church is having a unique health message, a message that helps people to prevent themselves from falling sick. So what we do is that we organize uh, health camps and we also organize health expos through which we are bringing about a greater awareness among the people about the need to take care of their health. So you have various specialty, uh, specialties that you 
um, share. You have physiotherapists, you have massage, you have doctors. Yeah. That's yes. What... Yeah. Uh, in our church, we do have people from several health science backgrounds, and as you said, that we have. I'm a psychologist myself, and then we have. Um, uh, physiotherapists and we have uh, one doctor and several nurses we've got and usually when we organize a um, health fair uh, all these people work with us and and also there are people who have studied health sciences broadly they also come and uh, help us in organizing this and there are people who are experts in massage okay and these people provide their skills and abilities and as a result of which we are able to help people through this uh, phase to help themselves to take care of their personal health and Fantastic. thus they will be able to prevent themselves from falling sickness. Fantastic. Dr. Solomon, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, uh, and we'll be right back right after a short break. Welcome back to the program, coming to you today from Mumbai, India. Next up, we're going to travel not too far from here to one of the most populated regions of the world, Bangladesh. And Pastor Doug Venn is talking to Dr. Lee. Thanks, Gary. I'm right now here in Bangladesh with my good friend, Dr. Miu Ju Lee. And Dr. Lee, good to have you on the show today. Yeah, good to be with you. Where are we here in Bangladesh? Now we are in Kualbatan, Kaliakur, Gajipuru where our Bangladesh Adventist uh, Seminary and College is located. Okay, well that's quite a mouthful to say that, you know, <laughs> the, the village name and the province name. Yes. Uh, here in Bangladesh, how many people are there? Oh, 160 million people live in a small country. Wow, wow, that's great. Uh, now, I know that uh, God has called you and your family to serve as missionaries, but yes. what's that story? Uh, uh, to make the sh short uh, story short, actually I was converted from Methodist when I was 17 years old. At that time I decided to be worldwide missionary. God fulfilled my dream. First I went to Argentina as a missionary for six years. I served church membership there. Then uh, I was dreaming to go to Africa, but God called me to be in Bangladesh, but I am very happy to serve the people who are here. Very good. Yeah. How long has you and your family have you served here in Bangladesh? Uh, I came here 2005, uh, al almost uh, uh, nine years, more than nine years wow. already. Yes, that's great. Yeah. And in those nine years, what have been some of the lessons that you have learned? Uh, here, uh, I have learned how to love the people because mm. these people even though they are very poor they are very noble people god has given me chance to love and serve the people i like and i love to uh, serve the people who are in bangladesh that's great uh, mm. dr lee yeah. that uh, you're following christ's method alone <laughs> to then care for the people mm. and have that uh, that impact with the love of yeah, God to yes, serve. Yes. What are, can you tell one story of how you've seen uh, God work in maybe a, a life of a student or you know someone? Uh, for example, uh, when I was working, uh, serving in Bangladesh uh, Seminary and College, our school, I saw many students, they came from different background, even from uh, different religions. But really God is so great. He changed their lives in the college. Now they are serving as leaders and servants in our denomination. Wow, that's uh, great. That's yeah. great to see how you've yeah. been able to see uh, through education how yeah. lives have been improved yeah, yes. as well as then how the country has been yeah. able to be yeah. improved yeah. through their service. Yes. So what are some of the, the challenges and opportunities that you face here? Because you're serving as the, the union president here in yeah, Bangladesh. Yeah. So what are those, some of those challenges uh, that, and opportunities yeah, that you're thank facing? Thank you. Uh, last seven years, seven months, I was serving as college president. But now I am uh, serving the people as a union president. Actually, there is opportunity here to reach the people through education system. Since this is uh, uh, other religion country, dominated country, uh, reaching unreached people, education is the best way to reach the people. Mm. When they are young, our children are young, this is opportunity 
to educate them to make the people of God. Right. Yeah. But uh, there is a great challenge right. because uh, uh, financially it's very poor this country. So we need to develop a lot of things through education system. Like, like I know you were uh, sharing with me as yeah. we've been visiting here yeah. in the country yes. that your goal is to, and vision is to have each of the schools around mm. the nation to become self-supporting uh, financially yes, yes, yes. and to have work-study programs. Yeah. Why is that so important? Uh, actually, uh, we have uh, seven boarding schools, but financial is very uh, difficulties. Uh, so we want to teach them how to go to self-supported institution. That's why we need to develop several types of uh, project. When we teach them that types of income generating project, our students will be studying uh, with self-supported you know, uh, uh, system. That is my uh, conviction. That's great. Yeah. Can you g share uh, for our viewers, what are some of the examples of uh, having this uh, work study or like uh, income generating project? Uh, Practically, yeah. what, what are some of the schools doing now that's yeah, working? Thank you. Uh, especially if we would make some uh, uh, pure water drinking system, okay. it would be good to generate uh, income for the school. Also, we can give that water for the community service. Right. Another way, uh, in Bangladesh, there are 30,000 NGOs. Wow. Many people travel to the local village. If we would build some guest house in our school, it would be also good income generating. Another is a, a goat project. Mm -hmm. That animal is very good to grow in Bangladesh. For right. example, if we would go to uh, East Bangladesh Mission, right. Whole year there is food in the hillside and mountains. When we really reach this idea, I think uh, and believe we can uh, earn a lot of uh, funds so that we can support for each school. That wow. is my conviction. That's great that yeah. you uh, that God has put in this vision yeah. to have uh, a water bottle uh, yeah. and filtration of. Yeah. Uh, plants at one of the schools as well as even to have goat ministry yes. where people then can uh, raise these uh, animals yes. and then uh, either sell the milk or sell the animals and yeah. that way the school and yes, the students yeah. are able yeah. to, to earn their uh, tuition payments. Yeah, Dr. Lee, it's been great, but I know I want to ask Mrs. Lee uh, to come. Gary, Thank it's you. been Thank great you. to be here with the Lees and here in this beautiful place in Bangladesh. So reporting live from this village, I can't say the name very long, but back to you, Gary. <laughs> For many Adventists, their first view of world mission came through the mission spotlight presentations that were shown in summer schools all around the world for many, many years. Produced by the Heinrich family, these presentations just opened up new vistas for people to see what was happening in mission around the world. Well, I'm delighted to tell you that Mission Spotlight is back. And the Adventist Mission DVD that we produce and that's sent to churches all around the world is now going to be called Mission Spotlight. It will still contain the stories that you've come to love. Uh, every quarter there will be three major presentations that can be shown once a month. Or if you prefer, there'll be a new story that can be shown every week. Next up, we're going to see a story from the Mission Spotlight DVD, a center of influence that's making a difference in Korea. Centers of influence are transforming how we do ministry in certain parts of the world. A center of influence serves the needs of the communities in a number of ways. This can be an opportunity to minister to people in creative, new ways. We find centers of influence dotted across the globe. In Korea, this concept has been in place for years now. They are serving their communities in practical ways. Kwon Jun Heng is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor who is heavily involved in coordinating centers of influence throughout the Northern Asia-Pacific region around the world. There are 110 centers of influence in Korea, and uh, today we visited uh, a restaurant which is run by the Seoul Central Church. The Seoul Central Church is located in the very center of the Seoul metropolitan area. The church is located in a very busy and expensive area, but the church only opened once a week. 
the church decided 12 years ago to open their cafeteria to the public to provide good vegetarian food. In the business area, there are not many vegetarian restaurants. And uh, across the street, and, uh, there is a Cho Gesa. That is the headquarters of the uh, Korean Buddhism. And uh, they are all the Italian people. And then as we started, we didn't have uh, much customers. But these days, we are entertaining 180 to uh, 200 people every day. Most of them, almost all of them are non-Advanced members. But uh, they really love our Adventist style health food. In the beginning, the church invested a lot of money to renovate the cafeteria. But today, the restaurant makes a good income and provides jobs for six Adventist members. With the income, they make donations to the local government. In that area, the church has a good reputation. The church decided to provide a scholarship for needy students. So regardless of their religion or background, any middle school student and high school student can come to this church and get the full scholarship. And as a result, some of them are uh, majored in theology. And one of them is serving as a choir conductor of the church. And then still they do have a more income. Therefore, they uh, begin to help the uh, elderly citizens. As we visit the church every Sabbath morning, the church entertains more than 200 senior citizens, and the church provides them not only spiritual food, but the physical food also. And uh, twice a month, they are providing their round trip uh, bus fare also. As a result, the church baptizes about 60 people every year from that ministry, as they support the senior citizen ministry. This center of influence in the heart of Seoul has been a light to the community for more than 12 years. Please pray as it continues to grow and serve the community. Well, I hope you've been inspired and challenged by today's 360 degree view of mission around the world. From the teeming metropolis of Mumbai to Mongolia, to education in Bangladesh, to centers of influence, in South Korea. People are sharing the light of God's love in many different ways, many creative ways. Please continue to pray for mission around the world. Uh, pray for frontline mission workers. It can be challenging, it can be discouraging, and it's very encouraging for them to know that there's a world church praying for them. Before we go, I'd like to offer you a free gift. It's just a small thank you for your continuing support for mission. The book is called True Believer, and if you live in North America, we'd love to send you a free copy. It's an exciting story written by Gina Wallin, who writes the mission stories for Adventist Mission. It's a story of a young man who, in his early 20s, in communist Russia, discovered the love of Jesus Christ. Well, that's it for today's program. For Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, let me try. I know we're a bit fewer in number. Maybe the weather has scared some away and people are just uh, taking it easy watching on live stream. So we welcome you too. But let me say that again. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. That's better. Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, you know, I, I woke up ready to go as, as we usually do. And I, I had to message uh, the, the board members because thankfully my wife went down to our basement before we left and there was a pool of water. And so I was worried I was going to make it on time, but I was saying to some who were meeting in my office before, you know, it's because I, I'm, it's a stewardship emphasis Sabbath today, and I'm preaching on material things today. So, you know, a little bit of a test. But I, I have to practice what I preach. And even when we have uh, little or great trials, and this is a little trial, uh, we have to say, God is good. Amen? Amen. God is good? All the time. And all the time? Amen. And so we want to welcome you today to the Hamilton Mountain Seventh-day Adventist Church. And especially if you are a visitor here today, we want you to know that this is the place where Jesus is making things happen. And we are so glad that you are here with us today. So if you're visiting with us, can you just raise your hand and, and so we can welcome you properly here today? If we have any visitors, you can raise your hand. Wow. This is the first time I've been here and no one has raised their hand and, and uh, said they're a visitor. Well, he, here's what I was going to say next. If, if, when those who were visiting, if they were here, uh, raised their hand, I was going to say, well, we have a visitor's uh, lunch downstairs. And now I don't know what to do with that because the next thing I was going to say is we, we were wanting to reestablish the lunches as they were when they first started. And, and that was to say that, you know, on the first, second, and fourth Sabbaths, those lunches would be for visitors or those who need a, a good meal, right? Those maybe, maybe you're coming to church today and, and, and this is going to be the best meal that you get all week. Whether you're a student, a newcomer to Canada, you've hit hard times. We have our visitors lunches for the visitors and especially for you if you're in that camp today. But now that there's no visitors, I know we have food. I was gonna say, we don't have enough food for everyone, but we have enough food for visitors. So I'll just say this, if you need a good meal and you wanna come downstairs and join us for, for that lunch, we may not have enough for everyone because it is a visitor's lunch. Next Sabbath, on the third Sabbath of the month, we do have our general uh, potluck that the hospitality team is preparing for. So everyone is welcome for that, but maybe, maybe peek by the kitchen on your way out and, and see if you can grab a, a little bite to eat since we don't have any visitors today. But for the family who is here, we welcome you to the house of the Lord today and, and God bless you as we worship together. Um, again, we're not going to get a, get up and, and go around and welcome everyone, but maybe just turn to your neighbor and say, welcome, happy Sabbath. The person behind you just say, welcome, happy Sabbath. And then uh, Elder Brendan will come up for the announcements. Welcome and good morning and happy Sabbath again. And um, I'll just start off with uh, a little bit of news that I guess I'm not too pleased about. Yeah, the weather is outside. It was a bit nasty last night. Then it started to rain. It got a bit warmer and the snow kind of melted away. So unfortunately, our youth sledding um, for this evening will be canceled due to uh, the, I don't know, the mildish, strange weather. Um, you know, we don't typically pray for, you know, the, those kind of, I guess, conditions that we wanted today. So um, it's a little bit sad for, for that. But um, so that'll be postponed. Um, but we will be having still having our games night here at six o'clock. So um, any of the youth who are looking forward to going sledding be here at six o'clock. We'll have some treats and play, play some games and have some fun. So, um, yeah, that's unfortunate. We have a number of announcements here. Um, Obviously, um, a week of prayer, or, uh, 10 days of prayer, prayer meeting uh, continues to go on. Um, our Zoom discussion from 6 to 7, um, each Sabbath about difficult passages, is still happening, Brother Rick? Not today? Okay, not today. Okay. 
seen here uh, Children's Church. Um, parents are invited to accompany their children um, under the ages of four. And the theme is Powered by God. And uh, special thanks from the music department for organizing the Christmas drive, help support the community service, and uh, the personal care items and th things that were collected um, went on those to, you know, to help those in need. So uh, thank you for that. Um, there's a collection here for uh, Sister uh, Grace and family. Um, you know, we see here uh, incurring some debts um, during the care um, of the family. So if we could, um, you know, mark the tithe envelopes as you uh, see stated here and um, just give what we can to help support. This is kind of dangerous, but Pastor here has his new number posted um, all live out there. I don't know, um, typically you don't do that. You might get a lot of phone calls and a lot of things, but that's his new number. Um, he switched from his Alberta number. So this is his new number, as you see here, 519-616-4001. So, um, you know, don't just call him if you feel like chatting about anything, you know, don't, don't bother him too much. You could, he says, right, but, um, you know. So um, we have some people here to pray for. Um, continue to pray for our sister, uh, Cindy. She had surgery this week. Um, continue to pray for our brother, Proud, as he is um, on the mend. And um, this just in, um, if we could pray for our dear sister, Jenny Lynn, who requires surgery. So um, church, you know, she's, you know, been a part of us for quite some time now, although we may haven't seen her, but she's still in our hearts and in our prayers. So keep her in your prayers, um, church family. Um, we also have bread today, as I was told by Brother Simba. Elders meeting um, this coming Tuesday, 7 to 8 on Zoom. Uh, Brother Turner, it's your time. Good morning, church. Man, it's like five of us here. I know it's more than that. And I understand. Um, if you were living in Guelph, maybe you wouldn't be at church today. Because you got it in abundance. So you're in Hamilton, so you should be a little bit warmer. Good morning, church. <laughs> it's so happy to be here. You know when you see me stand here, I always talk about the Pathfinders. And um, one. Remember I told you that we're going to ca camping this year? We got a message on Wednesday, Pastor, that um, the camporee for 2024 holds f over 50,000 people. And this week we got a message that it is sold out. So if you're planning to go to camp with us in terms of Whoever you are, you cannot go anymore. <laughs> it's all sold out. So now what we're doing, all 59 of us from the Highlanders, that's our total, we're preparing ourselves for the next six months. The seventh month, we have already been prepared. So the eighth month, we will be marching, not to Zion, but to Gillette, <laughs> okay? So, and we thank all those who have so far been able to help us on the way. We still need your help. Hamilton Mountain Church, thank you so much. I've not seen it yet, but thank you so much. Other members of the church who have done their best, thank you so much. Other members of the church who have promised to do their best, there's a reason why I'm doing this. <clears throat> I will speak to you after. <laughs> but we thank you. Another thing, on another great note is that, remember we do Pathfinder Bible Experience? Who remember that? We did it here last year, where we had all those questions for the kids, and they answered them in a great manner in which they, be, they came first in, their, in round one, and then it became third in the conference level. We're having that this year again. And we are the host church again on February the 3rd in the afternoon. You can be here, but as usual, there are ground rules for our 
Bible experience, exposure, and we let you know those ground rules when that time comes. Because you can't disturb your kids, you can't disturb anything, but you gotta, if you know the answer, you can't see anything, or else I will put you out, <laughs> stuff like that. But that's another fun experience for our kids coming in a few weeks. So that's something that I need to share with you today, that you know that our Pathfinder Bible Experience will be here for the Southwest, Southwest region on the 3rd of February in the afternoon. Okay? Let us all support our Pathfinders. Continue to support our Pathfinders. Continue to support our young people. And if you have not done so, being a part of the Pathfinder Club or the Adventurers Club, I'm going to let you know. Just talk to me. We'll take your kids. The first and third Sunday of each month, we take them for two hours. And we groom them to be young men and young women for the Lord. Thank you so much. And continue to support us again, I say. And have a wonderful Sabbath in this warm weather. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Turner. Uh, also, seniors ministry meeting tomorrow. Tentative. <laughs> Do you have a way of getting in contact? Okay, okay. So I'll leave that there. Um, am I missing anything? I think we're good. So that brings us to the end of the announcements. Church. Oh my goodness. The annual business meeting, January 27th at 6 p.m. Um, I know we all look forward to that. So um, please be there, and um, yeah, let's bring our um, godly spirit to that meeting. And um, again, August Personal Ministries would like to you know, thank for the contributions for the lunches, so don't forget that as well. And um, as well as our sick and shut-ins people who need uh, prayer requests. And uh, to our, I guess, online viewership, um, like I said a couple weeks ago, if you could uh, drop in the chat box where you're watching from, we would like to know and i uh, like to communicate with you in that way. So uh, have a blessed Sabbath and uh, we'll now have our opening song. Let us pray together. 
our Father in heaven. We thank you that in spite of the blistering weather and perhaps more blistering in other places than here, that you are with us still. And though it may be cold in this winter season that has finally come upon us, your spirit is here with us in this place. And you offer to warm our hearts with your love, your grace and compassion, O Lord. So may we receive that grace into our very lives, into our very beings this day, O Lord. Father, help us to not leave this place without being blessed by you, O oh God, without you touching our life, like your son Jacob, who became Israel, O oh God. We will not let you go, O oh Lord, until you bless us. Father, we pray too that your spirit would be made known amongst our children today as it is children's church, that their worship as we know it is a delight to you may be offered in, in sincerity and in joy that only children can bring to you. But bless their program, oh God. Bless our, our worship today. And Father, point our hearts and minds and fix our eyes upon your son Jesus, our King our maker and our king who we worship this day. In Jesus' name, let the whole church say, amen. amen. At this time, we'll invite our children to come forward. It is children's church today, but before you break and go downstairs for children's church, Brother Sheldon has a children's story for you. So boys and girls, please come forward and join us here at the front. guys glad you made it hey. hi all right this is a story about one of the things that Jesus was doing and the story that he told when he went to somebody's house hanging out with his disciples he went to somebody's house hi and he told a story so this is one of the stories that he tells to help us right make it to heaven all right. Jesus was with his disciples He's having a meal at this guy's house and he tells the story about a banquet that someone was giving and he was invite and he was inviting everybody to. Right? And when it was time to eat and everything was said, he set the man, he sent his servants, go out and get all the people and tell them to come. So the servant went out to go get some people to go to this big banquet. When he went to the people to get them after everything was done, everybody said, uh, I'm kind of busy. Would you like to come to the banquet? No, uh, I'm kind of busy. I just bought a new car. I have to drive my new car. I have some horses I have to ride. I'm busy. Everybody was busy and didn't want to go to the banquet. So the servant came back and said, well, master, I tried to invite the people and they are busy and they don't want to come. They're doing other things. So he, after preparing all this food and making everything ready for people to come, the people didn't want to come. So the master said, what? Go out and get all the other people who are in the alleys and the laneways and go out and get those people instead because I want lots of people to come. So everyone made up uh, after all the excuses, uh, some of the other people said, okay, yes, we will come. But even then, after he got the other people who didn't get their first invitation, they still, there was still so much left. The servant said, we got some people, but there's still a lot of room left, lots of seats left, lots of places still left for people to come. 
And so once again, he said, go out and get everybody, get everybody, the lame, the sick, the poor people, every single person. I want my house to be full. I want lots of people to come. I want lots of people to be here. And so that's what he did. He went out and got lots of people who were willing to come. Those people were more willing to come than all the rich people and the big status people and the, things, the people who had lots of things. So Jesus said, I'm not going to be eating with any of these people anyway because they're not ready to humble themselves and come to this party and, you know, be with me. They had more important things to do, it would seem. But nothing's really more important than being with Jesus, right? And going to heaven, right? So they, was, they had to learn that lesson. I want you guys to learn that lesson because Jesus is the most important thing. He was talking about himself when he was the guy inviting people to heaven. That's who he was really trying to say, it's me. I've been trying to invite all of you guys to come to heaven and be with me. That means you have to be good and be nice and all those good things, right? Nice to other people and help people to, to get to heaven. This is the meal that he wants us to come and have, to just be with him in heaven. This is our job to try to get there, right? Obey the Ten Commandments and say Jesus is our Lord and Savior and we believe in him and he's the Son of God and we're all going to go. Don't we all want to get there? Yeah, we do. Huh? No more excuses, right? Let's not turn down the invitation, right, that Jesus is giving to us. We want to make it. We want to get there. So let's all try. Okay? Good? Good. That's the lesson. Let's make it to heaven. Let's make it to the feast. Okay? All right, good. Who is going to pray for us? Wow. Laya, how about you, man? What's your name? Kyle. Kyle. Kyle, you pray for us. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that we're here safe and sound. Please protect us. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. Please help us to be obedient to our parents. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you. And Tannis. Tannis will pray. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Jada will pray first. Go ahead, Jada. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for our mom and dads. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for our aunts and uncles. Thank you for everybody. Now we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, and we'll finish with tennis. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. And please help us for the day that you have given us. And please help everybody to be good. And Jesus, say we pray, amen. amen. Okay, good. Okay, guys, now it's time we're going to go this way. It's Children's Church. So after this, we just go straight down through these doors and go downstairs. Is someone here for Children's Church? Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Oh. I know there's only a few people in here, but I believe God blessed us with voices. Amen? Amen. So let's try this again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> um, today's offering is for religious liberty. Today, more than two thirds of the world's population lives in countries where there are restrictions on religious liberty. As we worship together here this morning, religious freedom is denied in places such as North Korea and Saudi Arabia. In Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and many other countries, religious minorities face hostility and danger. In China, people of faith endure government surveillance and restrictions. This morning in North America, we are blessed. We have the constitutional right to worship openly and without fear. We can share our faith freely with others, and yet even here, we can't take this blessing for granted. 
As we read the headlines and look at the culture around us, we can see that the God-given gift of religious freedom is not always valued as it should be. And even today in this land of liberty, Sabbath keepers still face challenges in the workplace. More than 150 years ago, Ellen White urged us to hold high the banner of truth and religious liberty in these last days. The offering we will collect today, it allows our church in North America to do exactly that, to defend religious freedom in the courts, to support church members who face discrimination in the workplace, and to send almost a million copies of Liberty Magazine each year to lawmakers and thought leaders across our nation. Please give generously today as together we work to safeguard the precious gift of religious liberty. May the deacons please come forward. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Sabbath day, for the ability to come here and worship freely, God, without any restrictions. Lord, we know that this isn't the case in a lot of countries around the world, and so we don't take that for granted. But God, as we collect an offering now for religious liberty, I pray that you will allow this money to multiply and stretch to the regions where you want it to be sent, Father. And I pray that people may be blessed and religious freedom may be may be brought upon many more people because of our offering today. Thank you, Father, for what you've done in this place and what you've done in our lives and help us to give with a, an open and giving heart, God. This I pray in your most holy name, amen. amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Our scripture reading is from Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 to 16. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foresees, 
foresees evil and hides himself, but a simple passes on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord, the riches and honor and life, thorns and snares are in the ways of the perverse, and he who guards his soul will be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Cast out the scoffer, and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach, reproach will cease. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the faithless. The lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. The mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit. He who abhors by the Lord will fall there. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. Here ends the reading of the Lord. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. So before I started the, uh, start the Garden of Prayer, this morning my intention was to talk about the week of prayer and fasting because I was under the impression that we were, we were fasting. And uh, I got a surprise this morning when I said, why are we having lunch? Because we're praying and fasting. And Pastor was like, it's week of prayer, Pam. Uh, but glory to God, because it's been a, a blessing Amen. of a week, and uh, a week of guilt tripping when I accidentally took a grape or two in the fridge, but um, I thank God. Uh, but one of the things that I, I learned this week was to totally consecrate myself. I had a time of self-reflection where I sat on my own and I realized that Yes, I was born in the church. I had an opportunity when I was 18, when my family asked me if I knew why I was in the church. The only reason was I was dragged to church from when I was young until I was 18. And my grandmother gave me the opportunity to experience Christ on my own. And at that time I realized that I could never live without God. But in more realization this week, I realized that I've been a flip-flop Christian all my life. I mean, 48 good years and just flipping and flopping. And that really hurt me because I thought, I don't always practice what I preach. And it's about time because I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. Probation might close. And so... I didn't want to, to make a pact, or I didn't want to try and negotiate with God to say, if I do this, then do this. I realized that all I needed was God to grant me the strength to be able to be the child and to be the reflection of Christ that he needed me to be. So that's my testimony for, for this week. No more flip-flopping Christianity, no more flip-flopping as a child of God. And if any one of you in here see me flip-flopping, please, please, I'm begging you, pull me out and say to me, sister, you gave us the permission to rebuke you. Please do not do this. Because sometimes I do things without knowing and only in reflection I think, hmm, I don't think that aligns with the character of God. So I hope that also blesses you um, this, is my, this was my revelation in my time of prayer and fasting this week past. So I'd just like to invite those who would like 
prayer for specific reasons and spoken requests, or just to give gratitude to God for the week, for the year 2020, for anything, or even if it's a joyous moment, a dull moment, or for someone who isn't even present here to come forward, or wherever you are, let's kneel, or we can bow our heads. Heavenly Father, one who sits upon the throne. There is none like you, O Lord God Almighty. As we come before your throne of grace, O Lord, let all the other names fade away until there is only you, Almighty God. Lord, we come before you as we are in our honesty and in our sincerity, in our ruggedness, Almighty God. But we ask that you may cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that when you look at us, you may see the blood of Jesus. We thank you for these opportunities, these privileges, O oh Lord, that you continue to grant us coming before you over and over again, even in the filth that we sometimes are, almighty God. Lord, I uplift my heart before you in all sincerity as I pray, standing before your congregation, O oh Lord. I do not take these moments for granted at all. It is an honor and a privilege and so much gratitude unto you, O oh Lord, where I can stand here and we can commune and fellowship and pray with my brothers and sisters in Christ, O oh Lord. As it is today, O oh Lord, I pray that it is on that day when Christ comes through the clouds, O oh Lord, as we look up, almighty God, and we all cry out to our Savior, thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the week that has passed by. People in this church, the body of Christ as a whole, going through different challenges, O oh Lord, or going through and embracing different types of joys, almighty God. We thank you for all that because your word says that in all circumstances, we give praise. So we give praise, O oh Lord, to the joyous moments, to the down moments as well, O oh Lord. And as we look at the whole ecosystem of the world, almighty God, we see how much you are revealing yourself. The body of Christ is revealing itself and at the same time we are having certain churches fall, certain um, false prophets fall, O oh Lord, because you're weeding them all out and exposing them, O oh Lord, for who they are. Lord, as we stand before your throne of grace, we ask that the only word that is true and that shall ever be true, O oh Lord, is your word. Father, may we always, may we always read upon your word on our own, almighty God, because you are not like man that you should lie, O oh Lord. We have many people that are being led astray all over the world with false prophets, almighty God. But as you look at the doctrine, as it, you look at their ways, as you look at the fruits of the spirit, they do not align to your word, almighty God. So therefore, Father, we ask that you may have mercy on us, that you may give us the clarity that we need in our hearts, in our spirits, in our minds, O oh Lord, that we may be able to know that it is you when you are before us, O oh Lord. There are many people who are worshiping different Christs around the world, O oh Lord. People who are proclaiming to be Jesus himself, almighty God. 
and it saddens us. It saddens me, O oh Lord, as a body of Christ, as we have the realization that your people no longer read your word, O oh Lord. Father, may your word come alive. May it come alive. May it scream. May we scream it out because we have been chosen to be the witnesses, O oh Lord, so that we may witness the word in all corners of the world, almighty God. Awaken us as we sleep, O oh Lord. Awaken us and give us the clarity, almighty God, to know when to speak and when not to in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we continue to look at the ecosystem of the whole world, O oh Lord. We have so many people, not only in our church, O oh Lord, but just the body of Christ who do not feel well within themselves. It may be mental health problems, O oh Lord, because we are heavy laden with so many worries. We carry our cares and burdens and we for forget to say that we, you said to us that we should bring all those burdens to your throne, almighty God. So Father, whatever ailments we may have this morning, O oh Lord, may whether it's body, whether it's soul, whether it's mind, O oh Lord, we bring all that to your throne of God. Give us the courage and the bravery, O oh Lord, to walk unto you and remove the burdens off our shoulders and leave them to you, O oh Lord. Father, we are so unfaithful. We have no hope in you, almighty God. And your word says that if we do not trust you, if we do not obey you, then we do not love you, O oh Lord. And Father, I find that to be such a powerful thing, O oh Lord. And yet day by day we say we love you, Lord. And yet there is a lot of obedience. So Father, help us, almighty God, to be able to structure the way that we walk in our faithfulness, in our hope, and in everything that we do, O oh Lord. Father, we worry so much, but never a day can anyone stand in this church and say, I worried but I was able to establish this. That can never happen, almighty God. Father, help us, O oh Lord, and give us that strength to have the one perspective in knowing that in all things that we need, that you are so faithful, that your grace is ever so sufficient for us, O oh Lord. Father, if we cannot witness that to each other in these walls of this church as a body of Christ, what more of those that are lost, that are looking for something, almighty God, if they cannot see us walk the walk and we are walking in accordance to the character of Christ, O oh Lord, then where are they? Father, we are responsible as your children, almighty God, to go to show, almighty God, for who you are. Lord, we thank you so much, because even at times when words fail us and there are mumbles and rumbles, oh Lord, the Holy Spirit takes steps in, almighty God, and he is able to speak and intercede on our behalf, Lord God almighty. Father, as we begin this service, I ask that we all have a perspective of where we are with you, O oh Lord. Where are we in our Christian walk? Many people have been in this church for 30 years, for 40 years. What does that mean, O oh Lord, to be a member of a church? But what does it mean to be a child of God? May we all be challenged in that, O oh Lord. May that challenge us, almighty God, challenge us to drop certain habits. May it challenge us, O oh Lord, to look only unto you. Father, I thank you for the Kern family, almighty God. I thank you for their leadership. I ask, almighty God, that as Pastor Kern goes up there and is, is breaking the bread this morning, O oh Lord, and is speaking your words, that you may be with him, almighty God, less of him and more of you, almighty God. I ask that his words may penetrate in us, O oh Lord. We may receive them with an open heart. We may receive them with thanksgiving, O oh Lord God almighty. I thank you, O oh Lord, that as a church, we can be supportive, that we can rise up to support this young family, his wife, his children, almighty God, that they may be able to do their work to the best of their ability, O oh Lord God almighty. But Father, also as a body of Christ, coming together, not only in reconciliation with, with each other, but with you, Christ. 
Father, I thank you for these moments and for everybody who is in front and for those who are online, those who stand, who, those who, who bow their heads, those who kneel in their seats, almighty God. Have a visitation to each and every individual person, O oh Lord. We ask that you may rest upon them. Your hand is not shortened, almighty God. Reach out to them in their joys, in their cares, in their burdens, in their health situations, O oh Lord. Be with them. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your spirit resides in this home, in this place this morning, almighty God. We worship you. We honor you. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath once again, church. Oh, I only heard like two people. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, church. Can you turn to your neighbor and give them a big smile? A big smile. Tell them Jesus loves you. All right. Um, yeah. So we're so grateful to the Lord for giving us this chance. So about to praise and worship, let's open our hearts and our voices so that the Lord may receive our, bliss, um, our offering to Him. So we're going to go to uh, hymn number 427. Hymn number 427. In the land of faithless day lies the city for square. It shall never pass away for there is no neither God shall wipe away your tears there is no death no pain no fear and they come no time but years for there is no neither
there's no death, no pain, no fear, and they count no time but years, for there is no night. Oh God, shall wipe away your tears, there's no death, no pain, no fear, and they count no time but years. We're going to open our hymn books to hymn number 522. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. song we're going to sing before our pastor comes up is hymn number 334. Hymn 334. Come thou fount of every blessing. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Before I get into the sermon, I have a sermon before the sermon. I didn't plan this, but uh, I believe the Spirit is leading, and uh, you can test that. Uh, but I, I was talking to, uh, just uh, on the pulpit here, my sister Rashida, and I said, it seems a little bit subdued in here today. And, and maybe some would say, it's reverent in here today. Um, but you know, I noticed when it was children's story, the kids all, they, like, they weren't in seats here, probably because they were with their parents downstairs helping to get ready for children's church. But they all filtered in, and a little bit of the life came back in this place. Amen? Amen. And why I, I'm convicted to, to share this is I know reverence is often equated with silence. And I think that's part of it. It's showing that respect to God. Don't get me wrong. But reverence, too, is hearing that child cry in the sanctuary. Sometimes hearing the pitter-patter of the little feet, because that is a church that is alive. I remember uh, when I pastored uh, the church in Airdrie, uh, a city just north of Calgary, and we had just over 40 kids there um, at this time in, in my ministry there. And we had our very first children's church one Sabbath, and it kind of felt in, in there like it, it did today in here. And there was all this concern amongst the members uh, in recent weeks that church was too noisy. Church was, uh, the kids were making too much of uh, a ruckus. And I, I, I'm not trying to undo what we've been doing for our kids because we need to teach them reverence. We need to teach them respect. But church, we have to be careful sometimes too that we make a place for our kids to make them feel welcome and their parents feel welcome because uh, church, when without the kids, it kind of just feels dead. But when the kids are here, there's life. And there's a reason, Jesus said, for such is the kingdom of God when he looked to them. So let's remember that when we go forward and we pray that God is blessing them downstairs as they're worshiping the Lord today. But let us pray before we get into the actual sermon today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, prioritize our hearts on the things that are of you. Help the material blessing that we gain, whatever it be little or great, be redirected to a cause that puts you first and foremost in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. It is here we find a letter to those who have been taken captive already to Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 29 gives us actually a reference point, a context for how we are to live in our day as we are awaiting the soon coming of our Lord before we are brought to the promised land. Hear this letter in Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'll be starting in verse 4. God gives instructions to his people while they are living in Babylon. 
And we live in a world, in a society, in a culture, or whatever culture you have come from, where Babylon and religious and spiritual confusion has seeped into all aspects of our world. And we know that the Lord is coming soon. Amen? So how should we live our lives? Like I mentioned earlier today, I am emphasizing the theme of stewardship, how we use our material blessings, how we spend our, our monies. And some might say, why even talk about such things when Jesus is coming soon? Well, in this letter to the captives that Jeremiah delivered from the Lord to them, he would declare later on in the letter that they would be delivered from their captivity in what would only amount to a natural biblical lifetime. The Bible declares 70 years a Lord gives to a man, and to paraphrase, 80 if he is fortunate, right? 80 if he's blessed. Uh, and in, in this letter, God will declare that their captivity will only last for 70 years. He will declare that later on in verse 10. But starting in verse 4, this is what the letter says to the captives. And we can learn lessons for our lives today as we await to be brought to the place that the Lord has prepared for us at his coming. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to the captives. He has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Verse 5, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens mm -hmm. and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply and do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Work for the prosperity of Babylon. I have sent you away into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. And then to conclude, not reading the whole letter, but to conclude here, it says, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you home again. Well, maybe I'll read verse 11 because it always is such a good verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. There's good things as it continues on, but it's fascinating because even though their captivity will only last that of a lifetime at most, the Lord says, like they will have return, they will be called to return to Jerusalem one day. But the Lord still says, Build homes, plant gardens, find wives for your sons, husbands for your daughters, spouses for your children. And in this letter, we find a principle for us who are waiting for the Lord to return that I have heard summed up this way, and maybe you have too. But in case you have not, I have heard it said this way before. Occupy until he comes. Occupy until I come, says the Lord, to us in this letter. So when we think about the blessings that we have received as his children, and, and all of us here, we may be at different places of wealth, but whether it is little or great, materially speaking, the Lord has given each of us a blessing. And what will we do with that blessing while we wait for him to come? But this letter is also contrasted with a later word that comes from the Lord after the Babylonian captivity has ended, but while his people are still out of the land that was promised and have not yet returned. Turn with me to Haggai. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai was a prophet who lived 
in Jerusalem shortly after many of the Jews had returned from the exile of Babylon because by the time of Haggai's ministry, King Cyrus had given the first decree that God's people could return to their land that was promised to them, the land that they were taken exile from. They could return there and rebuild the temple. And a decree that would have them return to this land and have them rebuild the city and the temple would be the starting point of a prophecy in Daniel. But funny enough, it was not that decree that would be the starting point. You see, God's plans were, there was an attempt by the enemy of, of, of ours, by the adversary, by the Satan, to, to confound what God had promised. And, and kings of Persia would give these commands, but they would be thwarted. And, and people who were in the land would try and rebuff God's people from doing what he commanded and doing what was prophesied. But then eventually the king Artaxerxes would come and he would give finally that decree to which we could date the prophecies of particularly Daniel chapter 8 and 9 back to. But the, the point isn't that of this uh, sermon right now. So actually now we pick it up in the time of King Darius's reign in Haggai chapter 1. It was the second year of his reign and he too would give a decree that God's people could return and start rebuilding in the land that they were taken from, rebuild Jerusalem. And in verse 2, this is what we read. Contrasting that with what we just read in Jeremiah chapter 29, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses well, my house lies in ruins. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Look at what is happening to you, verse 6. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear, though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Yes, church, we are to occupy until the Lord comes. Plant gardens, build houses, get married even if it is the Lord's will for you. But do, do not do that so much so that you lose sight of the heavenly things. I heard it said of the things of God. Where is your heart at? God may have called you to occupy until he comes. But that does not mean that you are not to put God first and to still witness for his kingdom, church. To, to then even take the material blessings that he's given you. And while you may use it on houses and land and gardens and whatever that looks like in your context, it is not to say you should not use it first and foremost for the Lord. But too many of us have become in recent years and days, and it, and it feels so much, uh, so much more so when we are in times of economic turmoil, like I believe we are in these days, where we do not want to think of the things of the Lord because we're struggling enough as it is to make ends meet. But as we make our wages we might find our experience, even though we think we're saving that money that we can be giving to the cause of God in tithes and offerings, even though we're saving that money, we still have, as the prophet Haggai says, pockets filled with holes. How can it be? Today, I will say, before I get into the meat of the sermon today, I, I will say something this sermon will not do but the Bible does do in other places, and perhaps there are other times and sermons and studies for this. But I will not be establishing from the Bible, though the Bible does establish it, the command of tithing. 
The Bible does establish that. Even Jesus himself said when he was rebuking the Pharisees about how they did tithe but forgot about the more important matters, he still said, this you you should do in Matthew 23, verse 23. But today the sermon is not focused on the giving of the tithe, or literally a tithe means giving the 10% of our increase. The Lord does command it, but I'm not taking time today to establish that. I'm not also taking time today to establish how the Lord wants us to give also So in addition to our tithe, an offering. But what I will establish today are principles for how we do spend the material blessings that God gives us. And greater than that, the the condition of our heart that God would have it be when we do give. Because one thing the Bible does say is the Lord loves something. I hear you say, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. I hope today, by the end of the sermon, though I haven't spent time looking up the text and sharing them with you where the Lord commands that we give 10% of our income and the Lord admonishes us to give an offering freely out of what abundance we may have to give, I hope today you will be at a place where you're ready to study those things and you're ready to say, Lord, I want to give to you. I want to put your kingdom first. I want to put your church first. I want to use the material blessings you give me, what little it is, what great it is for your kingdom. I no longer, Lord, want to have an experience where my pockets are filled with holes, where I plant gardens and they come to ruin, where I eat and drink, but I'm never satisfied. This this condition that Haggai is describing, I mentioned just now how we live in days and it becomes hard not to to be like this in days because we live in days of economic turmoil. It is only in recent days that economists are saying, well, inflation is starting to come down. But at the peak of it in the last year, inflation was as high as as, as 10, 11%. And if you went to the grocery store, it seemed like even though their inflation rate was that, grocery uh, inflation was was almost double. So some of us, we may say, "How, how can I live like that, Lord, and still give back to you? It can be done. Stay with me here today. It can be done. But I want to get... Uh, This this sermon today may not spend so much time in the the clouds, but it will get to the nuts and bolts of our experience. Sometimes it is good to speak of the heavenly things, but the heavenly things also take practical form as well. Amen? And, And here's what I mean by that, contrasting the heavenly with the material in the here and now. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Jesus gives us a principle which I hope would be the first principle of our stewardship looking at the year ahead of how we are to spend our money and how we are to use the material things that he gives us. Luke chapter 16, looking at verse 11, we read that Jesus says this. I'll actually start in verse 10. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 10. If you are faithful in little things... You will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Now catch this in verse 11. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Jesus equates our stewardship. In other words, Jesus equates our stewardship with worldly wealth, worldly gain, little or great that we're given, with how we will manage the greatest gifts he has to give us that we will see on the other side of eternity. He's saying, if you cannot steward and prioritize right here your material wealth that God blesses you with, how can you be trusted with the heavenly things I have promised for you. I didn't say it, Jesus said it. But we don't make that connection often enough in our lives. To make it easy for some of us, 
who, who have been blessed enough to, to receive a paycheck in these hard days. And I know some of you here may be struggling to still find and secure a stable income. But here's a principle for, and I know God will bring you through and he will give you that blessing when your heart is in the right place, especially because he wants to use that to bless others. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel here today, don't get me wrong, but we know the Bible declares all the gold and all the silver is the Lord's. And we are not living for the gold and the silver because the gold in the streets of Jerusalem that is to come in the new Jerusalem, it's the pavement. So who cares really about all that? But still, he gives us these things to test and refine our stewardship on this side of eternity so that we will be good stewards in, in, in the eternity to come. So when you get that first paycheck, brothers and sisters... Yes, I know you have rent. You have mortgages to pay, groceries to buy for you and your family. But before you do anything else, ask, how would the Lord have me spend this increase? And that's where, though I'm not spending time on it today, that's where the tithe commanded the 10% of our increase comes in. And I learned early on in my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist. I'll tell you a story by the end of this that really brought it home for me. But I learned very early on, when I get that paycheck now and it comes into my bank account and I see it online, before it gets taken for anything else, give it back to the Lord. Put it on your tithe and offering envelope. And for me, I, I sometimes, I'll be honest, I sometimes feel awkward when the deacons come around and they, they bring the plate up here and I'm like, oh, I... I probably feel like I'm being a bad example because I think in our day and age it has been made so easy to give and prioritize the Lord first and foremost because as soon as you get paid you can go on a website adventistgiving.ca you can even have an app that does it and the very first thing you can do is give that 10% back to the Lord and I've learned in my life I, I am better for doing it than when I am tempted and have succumbed to that temptation not to do it. It's so easy. So yeah, you may not see me give here, and I like it because the Lord says, you know, do not let the, uh, the right hand know what the left is doing. It can be let, lo, let known, and, and, and sorry, let it not be known and be a little bit more low key. But it's actually a good financial uh, tool for you because what I've learned as I've given my tithe and offering and I prioritize the Lord first and I log into that website, Adventist Giving, and I give that tithe and I give that offering and that is the first thing taken from my increase in my paycheck, it's actually a tool that has helped me budget the rest of my increase. Because I, I've gone, Lord, I've dedicated this to you, single income family, so Lord, in order to make the rest of the ends meet, I'm going to have to actually write out and put in an Excel sheet and all that, what is the rest going to be spent on? So the Lord knows sometimes it may be difficult to give. Sometimes it is easier for others to give. But when we do that, we're prioritizing him and we're learning principles for how to spend our money as simple as making a monthly budget throughout the year. It, it, church, like I said, it's very nuts and bolts today. If you're not making a monthly budget as a family, as an individual, as a young person, planning ahead, for the rest of the years ahead. If you're not starting with making a monthly budget, do so because it shows good stewardship in the earthly things in preparation for the heavenly things. Amen? But Jesus says some hard things when it comes to money. If we turn a few chapters back to Luke, chapter 14, verse 33. Sometimes people don't just leave it as plain as it is. They, they try and allegorize it away or they try and explain it away. But I believe Jesus is, is saying something that is meant to be cutting to all of us, including me. Luke 14, verse 33. So you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything that you own. Can any of us be the Lord's disciple after hearing that? If you lost it all today, would you say God is good? It hurts him all the times. And all the time, would you say, God is good? I hear some yeses. 
and I, I said today coming in, my basement had some water in it. And I was like, Lord, why? It's the Sabbath. I don't need this today. I'll be honest and vulnerable with you. And he's saying, unless you're willing to give up everything, maybe I go home and the whole lower level, God forbid, but the whole lower level is gone. Would I still say God is good? I hope so. But I don't know. But Lord, I'm praying, get me to this place because that's where we need to get in our stewardship. And, and, and it's not saying that we necessarily, and see, no, this is where, you know, maybe I'm explaining in a way I'm softening what I shouldn't. But, you know, we need to get to a point where we would be willing to sell everything we have for the cause of God if, it, if he called upon us today. We don't want to be like that rich young ruler where he says, you've done this and that, nine out of ten, do one more thing and you'll have eternal life. So everything you have. And he says, and follow me. The young rich ruler, he went away sad. I don't want anyone here to walk away and go sad. But Lord, this day, and I speak even to myself, convict my heart that I'm not holding on to my increase, what little it is, so much so, that I'm not willing to give first back to you. Even, even the house that we were given in Brantford, I've told people and people who have sat down in her long enough, I tell people how the miracle that God did for us. And it was, and I give him praise for it. But if I put that house first, and maybe that was the lesson today for me. I was, I was thinking about it as I was driving here. It was a miracle that God blessed us to buy a house in southern Ontario. But if I put that house first and foremost above God's house, God have mercy on me. So too many of us, we, and again, it's, I know it's because times have been tough, especially in recent years. We, we've been a bit more frugal in giving to the cause of God. because we say, we say, how, Lord, can we give to your cause? But he's calling us to give to him first and foremost. And, and, and test and see if God will not open up the storehouses of heaven on our behalf. Not to merely open it up for opening it up's sake. People misread that verse if they think it's for that. But it's again to open it up so that you can give more to those who are in need. Give more to the cause of God. Give more to the witness of God's kingdom. There, there's a reason why we prioritize him first. Not just because the pastor is saying today, oh, put God first in your life. We give back to God because he gave everything for us. He put aside all the riches and splendors of glory of heaven to come down to this sinful, broken down, rotten earth and take on the form like you and me coming in, in flesh that, that looks all messed up and decayed like we are. And though he did not sin, he, 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 whatever he appeared like in all his glory before taking on flesh, he took on flesh and gave his life so that we may have eternity. So church, how can we not prioritize even in the material things, giving back to God? We don't give because we're like, oh, look at, uh, look at us. We're giving our 10% just as the Lord commanded. Look at us. The Lord, we're giving, I could, I could uh, watch Netflix and I'm spending it on this and said, well, good, that's a good thing, but that's not the reason why. We give because of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. And when you, whether you give it here at church and you write on the envelope or you go on AdventistGiving.ca or on the app, I want you to remember, church, that when you give, it is an act of worship. Sometimes we just make it like we're paying a visa bill or an electricity bill. But take time with the Lord in those moments that you give or you're preparing to give and saying, Lord, thank you for this blessing. And let me now give it back to you who made this all possible. Increase this as we pray during our offering time. Multiply this so that your purposes will be fulfilled. So that all you, des you desire everyone that would be saved, that could be saved. Make, it, make an impact to your will in this way, oh God. But there are principles too, now that we have that established, that we should prioritize the Lord first in, in our wealth, in our blessing, little or great. There are practical principles for how we spend our money, church.
And as I'm wrapping up today, I want us to look at some of the Proverbs and wisdom literature that speak to this. Because I meet too many Christians that, yes, we know we give the 10%, or yes, we should give some offering, but too many of us just do not know how to manage the rest financially speaking. And that's not good if we are called to be stewards of heavenly things. Let us be good stewards of the earthly things as we just read. So turn with me to Proverbs chapter 21. Just before we get to our scripture reading today, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 21. And I'm going to pick it up. I believe it's verse 7. My memory's failing me for a second. No, sorry, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. Here is a simple principle for each and every one of us, especially the younger ones among us, to start as early as possible. Because I know the Lord is coming soon. But we are to occupy till he comes. But we should not occupy in a way where we don't prioritize him first. But still... Prioritize him first and occupy till he comes. Working backwards now. So Proverbs 21, verse 20, it says, The wise have wealth and luxury. But notice this. But fools spend whatever they get. Ooh, that one cuts. That one cuts deep. But it is a godly thing, church, to save. It is a godly thing to save. Now, our board members will know that I don't like, uh, as I said to them recently, having church accounts become savings accounts because I believe they're there to do the work of the Lord, right? But even the church has to have contingency funds, has to have funds for a rainy day. And you too, family, you need to have those things set aside, put away. You might be saying... Pastor, I'm not even in a position to think about saving right now. And if that's where you are, I get that. But so many of us, we, we, we are in a place where we could, but we don't. Or we are in a place and we don't realize we are. Because I remember when we had a Sabbath school lesson and around this time last year. It was on stewardship. And one of the lessons you could really break down um, what you get as a blessing in your life from God, an increase in your life into two categories what I want and what I need. So as you look through your bank statement, family, like I said, very nitty gritty today, and you look at what you're spending things on, is it a want or is it a need? And you say, I don't have enough to spend. And you see the Netflix and the Amazon Prime and the Spotify and the Apple Music and the HBO. HBO, all these things. And is it a want or a need? I'll leave it to you and the Holy Spirit to determine what it is. But I, I say that because I remember looking once at my visa statement and seeing all these subscriptions and I had to say, like, Am I using half of them all the time? No. What am I doing? And so I cut back on some of it. Not all, I'll be honest. But I cut back because is it a want or need? And can I be better spending that money, saving it for a rainy day, saving it for my children's education, saving to, at one time it was, to buy a house. Can I, can I spend the Lord's resources wisely? Save it, remember. These are potentially all secondary things. The Lord says do these things. But am I saving because maybe there will be a cause that the church is in need and I will, need to, I will save and then when that time comes, I will use it for that too. Again, even in our savings, we can prioritize the Lord's ways. But notice too, in verse 7 of the next chapter, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. It says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is the servant to the lender. And though we are given statements like this, and though we are told that how we judge our material blessings will be evidence of our heavenly stewardship, so many of us, brothers and sisters, are in bad debt. 
Now, I'm not, I know there's people like David Ramsey and all these other Christian financial gurus, and I'm not saying one thing or another about them here and now, and maybe there is a time for that, but I'm not using that here. But I will say this, it is my, uh, I'm saying this not as a law, as Paul would say, but as, as my studied conviction that church, even for us as Christians, as you manage the blessings that God gives you, there is good debt and there is bad debt. And what are some examples of good debt? Well, a mortgage is an example. Now, some, I've seen some of you even look at me when I'm saying a good debt pastor. And maybe it's from some of the things you've studied, heard, I get. But trust me, it's a good debt because if I was able, Lord willing, to have, have been your pastor, say, five years ago even, and bought a house then, oh my goodness, what it would have been now. So that would have been a good, good debt to spend it on. But there are bad debts. And when you have your credit card bill and you're being charged 20% interest around there each month on your debt, how can that be a wise way to spend the blessings that God has given you? Like I said, I'm, I'm being very nitty gritty today. But this is what we need to pray that God would help us put him first Give back to him in the tithes and offerings and then make that budget. And some of us, we need to even put a line for payments on our debts each month and be intentional. Do I have on my budget here my wants or my needs? And what wants can I cut out? Yes, I have food and clothing, but maybe even I, I'm buying more than what I need to eat and I'm getting more clothing in excess than what I... We can be wise in what we use our funds that God has given us for. And church, I know there are some people who will say, okay, so I spend it first on tithe and offering. I make a budget. I've seen here that the Bible teaches a practice of wise saving rather than just spending everything God has given me. But church, even investing is a biblical thing. Now, you might go, what? Because I've read Spirit of Prophecy too, beloved. And I know what we're counseled in terms of spirit of prophecy, but sometimes some of us, and even Ellen White challenges us when we come to her writings without first establishing what thus saith the Lord says first, so that we can, can, can bring into the context what she says with what first the Bible says. And if you turn with me quickly to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, you'll have something to wrestle with here. Because church, I'll tell you that some of us need to be wise even in investing. And while we don't see our, our wealth increase is because we're not following principles that are clear in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1 says this, send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. But notice this, it says, but divide your investments among many places for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. So church, I'm not going to tell you, don't get me wrong, I'm just going to use this as an example, but I'm not going to tell you, especially from the pulpit, and I won't even get off the pulpit and tell you what to invest and not invest in. But, but one thing I'll say is if you get your, your, your paycheck and, and you, you, you put all the item lines that you need to in your budget and you get to a place either now or one day where you have a little bit more to not only save, but you have some to invest, and you say you throw it all into Tesla. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you to, it, to do that or not do it. But you spend it all into that one place. And then the next day, Elon Musk, he sends out a tweet or now a, a post on X, formerly Twitter, and you lose it all. That's not wise. And I think that's more to what the spirit of prophecy is speaking of. You're not just go out and just gamble what you have just because it's corporate. Be wise. And as it says here, when you do invest, divide your investments among many places because you do not know what risks lie ahead. And while some may go down, others will go up. And again, you can use that first and foremost, the increase giving. See, even on your investments, that's part of your increase. If you are blessed, you give that back to God. You give a portion, a 10%, a tithe, and then he may bless you to give some of it more in offering and the other needs you may have. Very nuts and bolts. But church, getting back to the heart of all of this, when we go back to Proverbs chapter 22, there is a principle 
that I don't know if you caught as we read this longer passage today from 1 to 16. I'll read it again for you here, these passages, but I remember a financial seminar that I took in an Adventist church. Again, in Airdrie. I mentioned Airdrie funny enough earlier today, but the treasurer there, his name was Glenn Howard, or is Glenn Howard. I uh, believe he's, he's still either the treasurer or an elder there, and he, he taught one one month, it was multiple weeks, a weeknight, a financial seminar for the church and the community. And he, he was giving a financial seminar on, on principles from scripture. I loved it. But one thing that stood out to me that he said, and I think is summarized in this chapter here, there is, and maybe this is why Jesus compares our management of earthly things with a reflection on how we will manage things in the heavenly places in eternity. Because he says, life and money Share these three things. In, in order to make money, you have to have time, thought, and action. And life as well is composed of those three things. Time, thought, and action. And so how you spend your money, church, is a reflection of your heart your priorities, the type of life you want to live and the type of child of God you are. Verse 1 of chapter 22. Choose a good reputation over riches. See, I, I hope I've given some practical advice today on how to spend the material blessings, but there's something more important than the material blessings. A good reputation your integrity before the Lord. And know what? People can even challenge your integrity, but as long as you know with God where your heart is and it is a good place, you've offered your sins to Him and you've allowed His Spirit to lead you in a righteous way, a good reputation, that good reputation before God is better than great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than gold or silver. The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. What you're going to see, church, as I keep reading here, is this, these statements on life in general, how we live our lives as his children, with how we then also use our money or material blessings. True humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and a long life. Corrupt people walk a thorny and treacherous road. Whoever values life will avoid it. Direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. Church, talk about jobs and increase, but are you prioritizing your job and your increase over your children and family? Have mercy. No, direct your children on the path they should go. But just as the rich rule the poor, as we read, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Those who plant injustice will harvest disaster, and their reign of terror will come to an end. You're here, you're going to see even more so, not just a way to live, but the themes of justice and injustice, giving versus oppression, intertwined with material blessing as well because church too many people including people who were once God's people have been given blessing from the Lord but have just used their material gain and their privileges or their place of privilege to oppress others but we when we put God first and we ask him to give us a selfless, self-sacrificing heart, if we're really, truly ready to give up all we have, because that's why he says you cannot be my followers unless your heart is in that place, we will use the material blessings that God gives us to impart. It won't be undone until he comes back. Don't get me wrong, church. But to impart, bring relief to those who are impressed, even with the material blessing, giving to the poor as we're about to see. I'll just continue reading here as it says in verse 8. Those who plan injustice will harvest disaster and the reign of terror will and their reign of terror will come to an end. Verse 9: Blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. Have a generous heart, church, when you make that budget. Throw out the mocker, and fighting goes too. 
quarrels and insults will disappear. Whoever loves a pure heart and gracious speech will have the king as a friend. The Lord preserves those with knowledge, but he ruins the plans of the treacherous. The lazy person claims there is a lion out there. If I go outside, I might be killed. The mouth of an immoral woman is a dangerous trap, and those who make the Lord angry will fall into it. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. No offense. I speak to myself too. But physical discipline will drive it far away. Even discipline in how you spend your material things will help with that as well. A person who gets ahead by oppressing the poor or showering gifts on the rich will end in poverty. You know, all the riches of this world too, we read in the book of Revelation, in one hour, the merchants will weep because it all comes to nothing. And we do not live for the gold and silver, but while we are given gold and silver, I'm asking you, what are you using it for? Church, we read how a fool spends whatever they get. Church, we spent too much. And I already, I'm not just saying this for the first time. Our ministry leaders already heard this from me at our last board meeting. I'll emphasize it again at our business meeting. We brought in over $300,000. Sorry, we brought in over $175,000, $178,000. And we spent over $300,000. We can do better. And we can do better in our own lives. And some of you giving me puzzling looks. Looks, come to business meeting. I'm not, people are saying, Pastor, how could you say that? I'm not, I'm not going to have a fight at business meeting. But we're going to be transparent. And we're going to have honest conversations. Because when we get our own house in order, God is going to bless us to do these things that he's called us to do. To lift the burdens of the oppressed. To, to spread the gospel and proclaim the grace of his kingdom. But we need to even start in our own personal lives because maybe our spending is a reflection of what we're doing. As we're, we're, we're in our own pocketbooks, we're spending too much on our wants and not on our needs. And as a church, we, we were spending uh, too much on things that are not of heavenly things and not giving back enough to the church for heavenly things. Amen. Church, it, mean, it means too, though, that we actually... So, in our community for investment, we, we spread our grain across the seas. And I'm not talking about investing now the church is fun and this investment and that, but I'm talking about actual people out there spending our money on people who are in darkness and need to see a great light. Yeah, yeah. To bring this all home and to conclude, I want to share with you a story in case you might be in a position where you're still saying, Pastor, this was all well and nice. And maybe... It's coming from a place of privilege, and I always have to acknowledge that when I'm speaking here. But I'll tell you, there was a time in my life where I was really challenged with whether I could give back to the Lord or not. Some of you have heard my story of how I've come into the church when I shared that testimony in the early Sabbaths I was with you. But one thing I don't believe I shared with all of you, I know in, in time I've, I've shared just here and there with some of you, is I was in university when I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I was going to Wilfrid Laurier University. Didn't know what I was going to be yet because all throughout my life I had some sort of call that spoke to a religious vocation. When I was Catholic, that meant priest, but that didn't feel right for many reasons, especially as I started reading my Bible and things weren't matching up. But I went to the University of Laurier for philosophy with a religious minor. And I took classes with Buddhist monks and imams and, and even Sufi mystics of, of the Islamic tradition. And uh, those were some of the classes I went to. And I say it that way because, unfortunately, in my darkness and in my depression, um, I didn't often go to class as I should. And though my family was never without, uh, I was not in a position where I could get a student uh, loan from OSAP, from the Ontario government. And my parents weren't wealthy enough where they could just pay for my education as many of us are in that situation. But because my parents made enough where they made enough that ends were met, but not poor enough that I could get a grant, I was in this limbo, but I remember my dad, he, I, was, I, was, I was so distraught one day 
being like, I want to go to university, Dad, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to go. And he said, don't worry, we'll find a way. And he took me to the bank, and he, and he co-signed a, 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 a loan, a line of credit, through the bank. And, and you didn't have to pay off this line of credit until you were done your studies. But because I was in this dark place, and this is my father, part of, because he co-signed, so you could treat it as my father's money too, and there's a lesson in this. I spent that money on things that were more than just tuition. And in just two years, I was $25,000 in debt. And tuition about that time was about $4,000 a year, much less than it is now. I know, it always goes up. $25,000 in debt. And in my last semester, now two and a half years in, or by the end of the semester, it would be two and a half years in, I became a Seventh-day Adventist, but only with one semester uh, under my belt. But those previous four semesters, like I said, I didn't go to class, I didn't apply myself as I should, and I spent my money on things that that loan was not to be spent on. I won't get into it because I don't want to glorify those things. But then I got called into the dean's office one January day, not unlike today. Before that, I actually went online to my student portal where you see all your classes and your assignments and nothing appeared, and the next day I got this email to come into the dean's office. I was actually already on, by this time, on academic probation. That wasn't a surprise to me, because my grades weren't high enough, for obvious reasons. But this one semester I spent as an Adventist, I got some A's and B's. Now, there were still some C's and D's. I was just learning to apply myself. But there were, praise the Lord, some A's and B's. And so I felt like I was starting to turn it around. I didn't know where I was going to get more money from, but that was tomorrow's problem. And the Lord said, only worry about today, for tomorrow has enough worries for itself. But then I got that, that, uh, that email. I, I came in and I met with the dean. I, I, dean, I had a feeling of what it was about. And I was on fire for the Lord in those days, in, in that, that fresh, baptized fire type of way. You know what I'm talking about? So I went into his office. I had prayed. I was confident. My friends had prayed for me. The church had prayed for me. I walked in and he said, listen, your grades aren't good enough. We're going to have to remove you from school. And, and what that meant too is as soon as I get removed from school, I have to start paying back that debt, right? So that was on my mind too. But I said to him, I said, listen, you don't understand. The Lord has changed my life. I started witnessing to him. I said, you, you see, I, I know there, there, there's some grades that could still do better, but you see, even last semester, I got some A's and B's, and I do this thing during the week. It's called Sabbath school, and it's really taught me to study diligently each day, and I start with studying my Bible, and I've taken the principles from studying my lesson, and now I study my textbooks, and, 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 and I'm taking um, tutorials to get better at writing and all these certain things. And he looked at me, he, he again looked down to my transcripts and looked up at me and he said, the evidence. And he emphasized that. The evidence shows me that you will not change. He didn't just kick me out at school. like He, he threw it like an atheistic like sword into my chest. The evidence shows me. And I, I wept. Later that day, I called the pastor. He came, he visited, he prayed with me. Thank God for that. But I went back home to live with my parents' tail between my legs. Thank God I had a place to go back to like that. But I didn't know what I was going to do. God called me to be a pastor, I believe. I was going to finish my education there and then go take my master's at seminary. But now... $25,000 debt later, what am I going to do, Lord? And I remember, why I'm sharing this story is I remember praying to God, Lord, I'd taken the Bible studies by then, I'd been baptized, I know that you've called me to give a tithe, 10% on my increase. And I very well that day could have justified, Lord, there is no increase. I went back, I got a job, I worked for Bell Mobility, I was one of those people, you had a problem with your cell phone, you called me, I'd give you the tech support how to fix it. So, I, I mean, it was an honest living, an honest wage, but it wasn't much. And I could have said, Lord, hey, I, you're calling me to ministry. If I'm going to pay off this debt, save up to go back to school again, 
how can I do so giving 10% to you? But as I prayed about it, I was convicted. Give back. Give back to God. Put me to the test. Give and it will be given to you. So I said, okay. And I did it. And by the way, I didn't even fully understand my tithe envelope, I don't think, at this time. Because, you know, you have the, I don't have a tithe envelope up here, but you know where it says tithe, and then it has the offering categories? Does it still, someone who has a tithe envelope in front of you, I haven't, because I've been online for so long, does it still say total at the bottom? I thought you put in like a $20 bill, and that's the total. And then you decide, oh, 10 of that 20 will be tithe, and then 10 of that will be offering, right? And, 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 and you can, you can and, and I don't know what, I, I was so confused, and, and the, treasure, uh, oh, so the, the treasurer went to me, and uh, I was doing it even differently, because that actually made a bit more sense. But I, I was doing something where, it was getting split up in whatever way where um, I just didn't understand that they were different categories between tithe and offering. And so why I bring that up, church, is because if you're ever putting money in that envelope and you're new like me, know that you, 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 you can't split a 20 twice, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you can't split a 20 twice. And that's somehow what I had done. Anyway, foolish thing. But I had prayed to God and I said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And in that time too... I was becoming more convicted in my call to be a pastor. I was looking at CUC Berman, and my wife was finishing her education, and she had become an ad well, not my wife, my girlfriend at that time, had finished her education, and, and I wanted to get engaged and get married to her. And I asked my, my father-in-law now his permission, and he said, yes, but he said, I have some conditions for you. If you want to marry my daughter, you got to pay off your debt, and you got to finish or at least get accepted into further education. As a father now of daughters, good advice. Good advice. But I said, Lord, how am I going to do these things? But I tell you, church, I gave faithfully every month that 10% and even a little bit of offering now and then. And in two years, $25,000 debt, gone. He did it for me. Even when I could have made every excuse to say, I can't right now, Lord. He will do it for you, church. If you are giving from a place of he gave everything for me, so I give for him. Some of you right now, and I haven't looked at the list. I know some pastors, they look at the list all the time of the church members and, and their tithes and offerings. And I know there's some, sometimes especially leadership times, there's wisdom in that. We want leaders who give. But to me... I want to leave it most times of the year with you and God. Right? I want to leave it with you and God. But I'll tell you something. I had a pastor who was a senior pastor, and he was very much into the list of who's giving and who's not giving. And he would go, and I, as his associate, would go and visit members who weren't giving. Right? Oh, I know, right? Whew. And though I'm not sort of like that, I'll tell you something that never failed. You know, when I come into your homes and visit you, with you, as I intend to do more than just at that door and even the fellowship table, um, I ask a question that he always asked in his visits, and I ask it now. Eventually, as we're talking about your life, your family, your work, eventually I'll come to you and I'll ask you, brother, sister, how is your walk with the Lord? How is your faith? And I'll tell you, every time we went on those visits with people who weren't giving, Yes, there was some sort of economic struggle. But when we asked that question, how is your faith? There was some wrestling that was going on here. Again, money and life have things that make them in some ways synonymous. And how we spend our money is a reflection on our hearts. We can make all the excuses not to give, but it might be a reflection on your heart. So this may be hard sayings, church, but I conclude with this now today. Give your heart to the Lord. Amen. Look to Jesus and see how much he gave you. And the year of 2024 and beyond, I pray you put these practical principles that I've laid out to the test. You get organized in these ways, but as you first and foremost look to Jesus, I pray that 
where it may have been more frugal in the things of the Lord. Maybe you need to be more frugal in other things, amen. But frugal in the things of the Lord, you will be more generous in the cause of God and his church. And we as a church will even do better to manage those resources to do a mighty work in the city of Hamilton. If you're convicted today, just bow your head and close your eyes with me. And I, I, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand while eyes are closed, but I'm just asking you to do this before God today. And similar to what I did when I was in debt those years ago, and wrestling with, Lord, do I have enough even to give? But if you're convicted today that God has given you even a little more than you're giving to give back to him, say, Lord, I, I want to walk in your ways. Commit that to him right now in, in, in the silence. And e even before you take this moment in silence, maybe you're not giving the 10% as you should. And you're actually at zero. I know the Lord commands 10%. But if, 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 and if you're convicted to give that 10% today, give it. But if you're still struggling, start with something. Start with five even. And I know that's not according to the commandment, but I trust that the Lord will meet you even where you're at with that five. And he will show you that you can make that 10. Whatever you can give out of the abundance he's given you because of the abundance of his sacrifice on the cross. Commit to him in these next few moments. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for the ability to give. Ask for the ability to give more. But commit this day to give to him. Father in heaven, a good reputation is greater than riches. And I pray that how we spend our riches would reinforce the reputation we have before not only our brothers and sisters, but before our fe fellow human being in general. And it would be evident in our giving, even if it is just known before you sometimes, that we are people who have put your kingdom first, that we have sought first the kingdom of God, and then claim the promise that all else shall be added unto us. Reprioritize our hearts, for when we have put the things of this world first, help us put you first. Help us give because what you have given for us. And Lord, just help us get our priorities straight as individuals, as families, as a church family. And may the reputation we have be one that is fitting of a steward who will inherit all good and eternal things when you come. May we occupy till you come but patch our pockets so they're not filled with holes anymore because we are giving to you and for your cause. In Jesus' name, amen. Lead me, Lord. Walk by 
by me across the lonely roads that I may face. Take my arms and let your hand show me the way. Show the way to live inside your heart all my days, all my life. You are my light, you're the lamp upon my feet all the time, my Lord. I need. Times I'd rather go along my way. Help me take the right direction, take your road. Lead me, Lord, and never leave my side. All my days, all my life. stand for the benediction. May the grace of our God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And may we give because he has given everything for us. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and grant you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Remain standing for the outro.
Spirit, as we're being ushered out, we're going to sing hymn number 469.